Attend, O oh reader, our tale of fantasy. I, I should really just go with tale of wonder, uh, because then I don't have to think about genre in the middle of the sentence. Anyway, welcome back to Paper Cuts, everybody. Uh, last week, we left off uh, eight chapters into uh, the extra day, and I was... And I was so interested by this book that I did not stop thinking about it, basically, the whole time that we were, uh, we were juggling limes and missing, uh, intended stream days. So, <laughs> that really tells you something about how much, how interested I am in this book. Uh, so I'm going to resist the urge to rattle on for five to ten minutes at the beginning of the podcast and just get started. Also, this episode might wind up a little short. Who knows? Uh, my low back has been bothering me. I think I've been sitting in my chair a little too long this week. So that's that's fun. I may have to uh, I may have to like you know find something to produce lumbar support during the be right back, or I might have to stop early. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. Anyway, let's dive into Chapter 9, A Priest of Wonder. He was a gray and nameless creature of shadowy outline and vague appearance. The eye focused him with difficulty. He had the air of a broken tombstone about him, with moss and lichen and wayward patches, for his face was split and cracked, and his beard seemed a continuation of his hair. But he had soft blue eyes that had got lost in the general tangle, and seemed to stray about the place and peep out unexpectedly, like flowers hiding in a thick-set hedge. The face might be anywhere. He might move suddenly in any direction. Uh, he was prepared, as it were, to move forward, sideways, or backwards, according as the wind decided, or the road appeared, a sort of universal scarecrow of a being, altogether. Yet, for all his forlorn and scattered attitude, there hung about his rags an air of something noble and protective, something strangely inviting, that welcomed without criticism all the day might bring. Homeless himself, and with no place to lie his extraordinary body, the birds might have built their nests in him without alarm, or the furry creatures of the fields and woods have burrowed along his voluminous misfitting clothing to shelter themselves from rain and cold. He would gladly have carried them all with him, safely hidden from guns or traps or policemen, glad to be useful and careless of himself. That, at any rate, was the mixed impression that he gave. Thank you, he said in a comfortable sort of voice that sounded like wind along telegraph wires on a high road. Kindly all. Actually, it would be, it would be less strained and more windy, so thank you. Oh no, oh no, my uh, my automated noise cleaner cuts out that was that really breezy voice. So I guess he has this voice. Instantly, the children felt delighted with him. Their sympathy was gained, and fear had vanished. The policeman, like a scapegoat, took all their sins away. They did not actually move closer to the tramp, but their eyes went nestling in and out among him. But their eyes went nestling in and out among his tattered figure. Judy, however, it was noticeable, looked at him as though spellbound. To her he was, perhaps, as her uncle said, a great adventurer the type of romantic wanderer, forever on the quest of perilous things, a knight. It was Uncle Felix who first broke the pause. Oh, you've come a long way. Oh, about the same as usual, replied the tramp, as though all distances and localities were one to him. Which means? From nowhere and from everywhere. And are you going on to always the same place, which is the end? He said it in a rumbling voice that seemed to issue from a pocket of the torn old coat, rather than from his bearded mouth. Oh dear, that is a very long way indeed. But of course you never get tired out. Her eyes were brimmed with admiration, and he shrugged his great loose shoulders. It was odd how there seemed to be another thing within all that baggy clothing and behind the, ha behind the hair. The shaggy exterior covered a slimmer thing that was happy, laughing, and dancing to break out. Oh, not tired out. A bit sleepy sometimes, perhaps. He glanced round him care carelessly, his strange eyes resting finally on Judy's face. 
Uh, but there's not. There's lots of beds about once you know how to make them. Yes, of, of course. With the child murmur with with a soft applause. Of course, there must be. And those with sleeps and ditches dreams as great as that, I know. They must, agreed Judy, as though grass and dock leaves were familiar to her. Then you'll get up when you're ready, don't you? That's it. Uh, but the trouble is, you're always ready. How do you know the time? asked Tim. The tramp turned around slowly and looked at his questioner. <laughs> time! And he exchanged a mysterious glance of sympathy with Maria. We lifted her eyes in return, but otherwise made no sign whatsoever. Hmm. Sit quiet like, and everything worth having comes of itself. That's living, that is. The whole world belongs to you. I've got a watch, said Tim as though challenged. I've got an alarm clock, too. Only you've got to wind them up, of course. Ah, uh, there you are. They got you got to wind them up. They don't go themselves, do they? Oh, no. I never knew happiness until I chucked my watch away. Your watch? Well, not exactly. No, he didn't mean that. I was using it at the time, anyhow, and what you're using at the time belongs to you. I never knew happiness while I kept it. Watches and clocks only mean hurry. It's an endless job trying to keep up with them. You gotta go so fast for one thing. I never was a sprinter, huh? <laughs> There's nothing in it. Life is a, it isn't a hundred yards race. You miss all the flowers on the way at that pace. And what's the surprise? He glanced down contemptuously at his feet. Worn out boots, your boots wear out, that's all. He looked round at the children, smiling wonderfully. Maria seemed to understand him best, perhaps. She looked up innocently into his tangled face. Ah, yeah, that's it, he said with another chuckle. You know what I mean, don't you, Messy? But Maria made no reply. She simply beamed back at him until her face seemed nothing but a pair of wide blue eyes. Eh, stop your clocks, go slow, the man murmured half to himself. You'll see what I mean. There's twice as much time as before. You can do anything, everything, because there's never any hurry. You'd be surprised. You're very hungry, aren't you? inquired Tim, resenting the man's undue notice of Maria. The tramp stared hard into the boy's unwavering eyes. Always, but then there's always folks to break, and there's always folks to give. Rather, exclaimed Judy with enthusiasm, and Tim added eagerly, I should think so. They seemed to know all about him then. Something had entered with him that made common stock of five of them. It was wonderful of Uncle Felix to have known all this before him. Yeah, we're all alive together murmured the tramp blood under his breath, and then Uncle Felix shoved and showed another stroke of genius. Uh, we'll make tea out here today instead of having it indoors. Tim, you run and fetch a teapot, a bottle of milk, some cups, and a kettle full of water. Put some sugar in your pockets, bring a loaf and butter and a, lo and a pot of jam. A basket will hold the lot, and while you're gone, we'll get the fire going. A big knife and some spoons, too, said Judy, crying after his disappearing figure. Don't let Aunt Emily see you. Tramp looked up sharply. Well, I had an Aunt Emily once, he said behind his head hedged-in face. Expecting more to follow, the others waited, but nothing came. Once? asked Maria, wondering perhaps if there were two such beings in the world at the same time. The man of journeys nodded. Oh, well, did she mend your clothes and things and love to care for you? Oh, she visited the poor, had no time for the likes of me. One day I fell out of a big hole in my second suit and took to tramping. He rubbed his hands together vigorously together in the air. Uh, here I am. Yes, I'm glad, said Maria kindly. Meanwhile, Judy, having decided to go and help her brother with the tea things, the other set to work and made a fire. Maria helped with her eyes, picking up an occasional stick as well, but it was the tramp who really did the difficult part. Only the way he did it made it appear quite easy somehow. He began with the tiniest fire in the world, and the next minute it seemed ready for the kettle, with a crossbar arranged adroitly over it, and a supply of fresh wood in a pile beside it. What do you think about it? asked him of his sister as they struggled back with a laden basket. 
Apparently, a deep question of some kind had asked for explanation in his mind. It's awful that he's got no one to care about him. I think he's a very nice man. He looks magnificent, awfully brown. Well, that's dirt, said her brother. No, it's travel. The tramp, when they got back, looked tidier somehow, as though the effect of refined society had already done him good. His appearance was less uncouth, his hair and beard a shade less hayfieldy. It was possible to imagine what he looked like when he was young, a sure sign of being tidy, just as to be very untidy gives an odd hint of what old age will... <clears throat> Just as to be very untidy gives an odd hint of what old age will eventually do to face and figure. The tramp looked younger. They all made friends in the simple, unaffected way of birds and animals, for at the end of the world there was no such thing as empty formality. The children, supported by the presence of their important uncle, asked questions, this being their natural prerogative. It came to them as instinctively as tapping the lawn for worms comes to birds, or scratching the earth for holes as a sign of health with rabbits. At first shyly, and then in a ceaseless, yet not too inquisitive torrent. Questions are the sincerest form of flattery, and the tramp, accustomed probably to severer questions from people in uniform, was quite delighted. He smiled quietly behind the scenery of his curious great face, but he answered all. Where he lived, how he traveled, what friends he had, where he spent Christmas what barns and ditches and haystacks felt like, anything, everything, even where he meant to be buried when he died. Yeah, where well, I've lived so happily. And he made a wide gesture with one tattered arm to include the, include the earth and sky. He had no secrets, apparently. He was glad they should know all. The children had never known such a delightful creature in their lives before. Uh, and you eat anything? Anything you can, I mean? Anything you can get, he means, corrected Judy softly. He gave an unexpected answer. Oh, I swallow sunsets and I bite the moon. I enable stars. Never need a spoon. He said it as naturally as a duchess describing her latest diet at a smart dinner party. With an air, too, as of some great personage disguised on purpose so that he might enjoy the simple life. That rhymes, says Maria. Uh, so does this. I live on open hair and bits of bread. The sunlight clothes me and I lay me head. The hissing of the kettle interrupted his musings. Oh, water's boiling. Hand round the cups and cut the loaf. A cup was given to each and the tea was made. Do you take sugar, please? Asked Judy the guest. The quietness of her voice made it almost tender. Such a man, or moreover, might despise sweet things. But he said he did. Uh, two lumps or one? Five, please. She was far too polite to show surprise at this, nor at the fact that he stirred his tea with a little bit of stick instead of a spoon. She remembered his remark that he had no use for spoons. Tim, saying nothing, imitated all that he did as naturally as though he'd never done otherwise in his life before. They enjoyed their picnic tea so immensely in this way, seated in a row among the comfortable elm tree, gobbling, munching, drinking, chattering. The tramp, for all his outward roughness, had the manners of a king. He said what he thought, but without offense. He knew what he wanted, yet without greed or selfishness. He had that politeness which is due to alert perception of everyone near him, their rights and claims, their likes and dislikes, for true politeness is practically an expansion of the consciousness which involves seeing the point of view of everyone else all at once. A tramp accustomed to long journeys, big spaces, obliged ever to consider the demands of impetuous little winds, the tastes of flowers, the habits and natural preferences of animals, birds and insects, develops this bigger sense of politeness that crowds in streets and drawing rooms cannot learn. Unless a tramp takes note of all, he remains out of touch with all, and therefore is uncomfortable. Is everything all right? asked Uncle Felix presently, anxious to see that he was well provided for. Everything, thank you. And if you don't mind, I'll have my supper here later, too. I've brought it with me. And out of one capacious pocket, he produced a bird. 
and it's a chicken, he informed them as they stared with wide open eyes. Maria was first to go on eating her slice of bread and jam. Unordinary things seemed to disturb her less than ordinary ones. Somehow it seemed quite natural that he should go about with a bird for supper in his pocket. Uh, however did you get it in there? asked him, modifying his sentence at just in time to avoid inquisitive rudeness. Well, it gave itself to me. That kind of thing happens sometimes when you're tramping. They know, he added significantly. You see, it's my birthday today, and something like this always happens on my birthday. Last time it was a fish. I fell in the stream, went right under. When I got out onto the bank again, I found a trout in my pocket. The time before, I slept beside a haystack, and when I woke at, when I woke at sunrise, I felt something warm and soft against my face like feathers, and it was feathers. There was a hen's nest two inches from my nose and six nice eggs in it, all ready for my birthday breakfast. I only ate four of them. You should never take all the eggs out of a nest. He looked around at the group and smiled. But I think the chicken's best of all. Maybe next year I'll expect a turkey or a bit of bacon, maybe. You never grow old, do you? Judy asked. Her admiration was no longer concealed. It seemed she saw him differently, a little from the others. Oh, just a nice age. You seem to know so much. Everything. He laughed behind his teacup as he fingered the chicken on his lap. Well, as to that, there's only a few things with knowing. If you can just forget the rest, you're all right. I see. But it's got to be plucked and cleaned and cooked first, hasn't it? Ah, uh, the chicken? Dear me, no. Cooked, yes, but not plucked or cleaned in the sense you mean. That's what they do in houses. Out here we got a better way. We just wrap it up in clay, dig a hole, and light a fire on top. In a half hour, it's ready to eat. Tender, juicy, sweet as a bit of honeycomb. Break open the ball of clay, the feathers all come away with it. Then he produced from another pocket a fat, thick roll of yellow butter. Freshly made, apparently, for it was wrapped in a clean white cloth. They stared at that for a long time without a word. Well, they go together, he explained, and the explanation seemed sufficient as well as final. Well, they came together, too. Did the butter give itself to you as well as the chicken? inquired Judy. The tramp nodded in the affirmative as he placed it beside him on the trunk ready for use later. And everybody felt in the middle of a delightful mystery. All were the same age together, bird and butter, sun and wind, flowers and children, tramp and animals, all seemed merged in a jolly company that sh oh, shared one another's wants and could supply them. The wallflowers wagged their orange bonneted heads. The wind slipped sighing with delicious perfumes from the trees. The bees were going home in single file, and the sun was sinking level with a paling top. When suddenly there came a disturbing element into that scene that made their hearts beat faster with one accord. It was a sound. A muffled, ominous beat was audible far away, but slowly coming nearer. As it approached, it changed its character became sharper and more distinct. Something about the measured intervals between its tapping repetitions brought a threatening message of alarm. Everyone felt the little warning and looked up. There, there was anxiety. The sound jarred unpleasantly upon the peace of the happy company. They listened. It was footsteps on the road outside. Okay, library, you're laying on my phone. I should probably have that. It's okay, you can stay where you are. I just need to borrow this song. See there? Was that so bad? It's like, yes, I hate when you move me. Huh. <sighs> Sorry, I just realized I don't have the little, like, you're streaming, wow, thing open. Oh. I must have forgotten to do my jaw stretches because I'm so fully on.
Oh, goodness gracious. Anyway, uh, chapter 10, Fact and Wonder Clad. Uncle Felix paused over his last bit of bread and jam. Tim and Judy cocked their ears up. Maria's eyes stood still a moment in the heavens, and the tramp stopped eating. He picked up the butter and replaced it carefully in the pot. I know those steps, he murmured half to himself and half to the others. They're all over the world, follow me wherever I go, hear them even in my sleep. He sighed, and the tone of his voice was weary, ill at ease. How horrid for you. Well, keeps me moving. He muttered, trying to conceal all signs of face behind hair and beard, which he pulled over him like a veil. As a policeman. The policeman? He can't find you here. He'll never see you. You're quite safe inside the fence with us. This is the end of the world, you know. He's not afraid. Never. Well, he goes everywhere, sees everything. He's been following me since time began. So far, he hasn't caught me up, but his boots are so much bigger than my own. The biggest, strongest boots in the world, and uh, in the end, he's bound to get me. But you've done nothing. The wanderer smiled at this. Well, that's why, he said, holding up a warning finger. It's because I do nothing. Now, I should. The steps came nearer, and he lowered his voice so that the end of the sentence was not audible. I mean, he said in a whisper, and he waved his arm imploringly, like the branches of some wind-hunted wind tree. There was a tarpaulin near the rubbish heap, and some sacking used for keeping the vegetables warm at night. That'll do. Quick, goodbye. In a moment, he was spread beneath the... Or rather, he was beneath the black spread covering. The children were sitting on its edges, quietly eating more bread and jam, and looking as innocent as stars. Uncle Felix poked the fire busily, a grave and anxious look upon his face. The steps came nearer, paused, came on again, and then finally stopped outside the gate. The flowing road that bore them ceased running past its custom way. The evening stopped still, too. The silence could be heard, the setting sun looked on. Upon the crumbling wall, the orange flowers shook their little warning banner. There came a tapping on the wooden gate. No one moved. The tapping was repeated. There was a sound of drums about. The round brass handle turned, the door pushed open, and in the empty space appeared the policeman. Good evening, he said in a heavy, uncompromising way. He looked enormous, framed there by the open gate, the white road behind him like a sheet. He looked very blue, a towering shadow against the sunlight. It was very clear that he knew he was a policeman and could think of nothing else. He was dressed up for the part and received many shillings a week from a radical government to look like that. It would have been a de it would have been a dereliction of duty to forget it. He was stuffed with duty as bat as brass buttons shone. Good evening, he repeated as no one spoke. Uh, good evening, replied Uncle Felix calmly. The policeman accentuated the word evening, but Uncle Felix emphasized the adjective good. From the very beginning, these two men disagreed. This is private property, very private indeed. We're having tea, in fact, privately, upon our own land. No property is private, returned the policeman, and to the law no thing or no person either. For a moment the children felt afraid. It seemed incredible that Uncle Felix could be arrested, and yet things had an appearance of it. Kindly close the gates. We cannot be overheard, and then be good enough to state your business here. Oh, no, that was Felix. Kindly close the gate that we cannot be overheard, and then be good enough to state your business here. He didn't offer him a seat. He didn't suggest a cup of tea. He spoke like a brave man who expected danger, but was prepared to meet it. The policeman stepped back and closed the gate. He then stepped forward again, a little nearer than before. From a pocket, hitherto invisible inside his belt, he drew forth a crumpled notebook and a stub of a pencil. He was very dignified and very grave. Oh, sorry. 
He took a deep breath, held the paper and pencil ready to use, expanded his chest until it resembled a toy balloon in the park, and said, I am looking for a man. Have you seen a man about? Uh, about what? About fifty or thereabouts. And disguised in rags and a wig of hair and a false beard. What has he done? It's like a game of chess, both opponents well matched. Uncle Felix was too big to be caught napping by clever questions that hid traps. The children felt the danger in the air and watched their uncle with quivering admiration. Only their uncle stood alone, whereas behind the policemen stretched a line of other policemen that reached to London and was in touch with the government itself. What has he done? repeated their champion. Well, he's disappeared. Uh, there's no crime in that. But he's disappeared with... The, the policeman co co consulted... <laughs> the policeman consulted his notebook him for a moment. A chicken and a roll of butter which don't belong to him. Roll and butter? No, sir, roll of butter is what I said. He spoke respectfully, but was grave and terrible. He's a thief. A thief? He lives nowhere, has no home. You see, sir, duty is duty. We're expected to run in people who live nowhere and have no home. What road did he take? Uncle Felix was, cle Uncle Felix was clearly pretending in order to gain time. The man of law looked puzzled. It was a roll of butter and a bird, sir, he said, consulting his book again. My duty is to run him in. The moment you run into him. Precisely. And having seen him come in here some time ago, I now ask you formally whether you've seen him too, and I call upon you to show me where he's hiding. He thrust one huge foot forward and held his notebook open with the pencil ready. Anything you say can and will be used against you later, remember. You must all be witnesses. If you find him. When I find him and his eye wandered over to the tarpaulin that was spread out beside the rubbish heap. It had suddenly moved. Everybody had seen the movement. There was no disguising it. Feeling uncomfortable, the tramp had shifted his position, probably wanting air. I saw it move, the policeman growled, moving a step towards the rubbish heap. He's under there all right enough, and the sooner he comes out, the better for him. That's all I've got to say. It was a most disagreeable and awkward moment. No one quite knew what was best to do. Maria turned her eyes as innocently upon the tarpaulin as she could manage, but it was obvious that what she was really looking at. Her brother held his breath and stared, expecting a pistol might appear and one, and someone might be shot dead with a marvelous aim, struck absolutely in the mathematical center of the heart. Uncle Felix, upon whom fell the burden of rescue or defense, sat there with a curious look upon his face. For a moment, it seemed he knew not what to do. The policeman, approaching still nearer to the tarpaulin, glared at him. Uh, you're an accessory, before, both before and after the fact. I didn't say he wasn't here. Oh, uh, you didn't say he was. The severe retort was unanswerable. He'll hang by the neck till he's dead. Oh, he'll hang by the neck till he's dead, thought Tim. Afterwards, they'll bury the body in a lime kiln, so even his family can't visit the grave. He looked wildly about him, thinking of possible ways of escape that he'd heard or read about, and his eye fell upon his sister Judy. Now, Judy was a strange, original maid. She believed everything in the world. She believed not only what was told her, but also what she thought. And among other things, she believed herself to be very beautiful, though in reality she was likely the ugly duck like a brood. All God has made is beautiful, Aunt Emily had once reproved her, and since God made everything, everything must be beautiful. It was that God made her too, therefore she was simply lovely. She enjoyed numerous romances. One romance after another flamed into her puzzled life, each leaving her more lovely than it found her. She was also invariably good. To be asked if she was good was a blundering question, in which the astonished answer was only an indignant of course. And similarly, she loved herself as be All she loved herself was beautiful. Her romances had included gardeners and postmen, 
stable boys and curates, ages of age of no particular consequence, provided they stimulated her creative imagination. And the latest was the tramp. Something about the woebegone figure of adventure that set on fire her mother instinct and, and her sense of passionate romance. Freud can't keep getting away with it. <laughs> she saw him young, without the tangled beard, without the rags, without a the dilapidated boots. She saw him in her mind as a warrior hero, storming difficulty, despising danger, wandering beneath the stars, a being resplendent as a prince and fearless as a deity. He was the son of the morning, and the dawn was in his glorious blue eyes. And Tim now saw that his sister of his, alone of all the party, was about to do something unexpected. She had left her place upon the fallen trunk and stepped up in front of the policeman. Stand aside, Missy, the individual said, and his voice was rough, his gesture very decided. It was, in fact, his arresting manner. He was about to do his duty. Just wait a moment, said Judy calmly, and she placed herself directly in his path, her legs apart, her arms akimbo on her hips. You say the old man you want to find is old and ragged and looks like a tramp? Yeah, that's it, replied the policeman, greatly astonished, and pausing a moment, in spite of himself, to... Oh. Sorry, I'm also a little sleepy. Oh, I think for sure once we hit the BRB, I'm going to make something warm to try and keep myself awake. Uh, that's it. Uh, that's it, replied the policeman, greatly astonished and pausing a moment in spite of himself. You'll see him in a moment. Just help me to lift a corner of this here tarpaulin, and I'll show him to you. He pushed her, deliberate, aside. All right, said Judy, her eyes shining brilliantly, her gestures touched with a confidence that surprised everybody into silence. But first I want to tell you that the person underneath this old sheet thing is not a tramp at all. Well, you don't say so, interrupted the other, half impudently, half sarcastically. Uh, what is he, then? I'd like to know. The girl drew herself up and looked at the great blue figure straight in the eyes. Oh, he's my brother, and he's not a thief. Your brother? The policeman was a trifle taken aback, and he guffawed. He's young and noble, she went on, half singing the words in her excitement and belief. And he's dressed all in gold. He walks, a, he walks like wind about the world, has curly hair, and wears a sword of silver. He's simply beautiful, and he's got no beard at all. And he's your brother, is he? Set cried the policeman, laughing rudely. And he just wears all that get up for fun, don't he? And he stooped down and pulled the tarpaulin violently to one side. He is my brother, and I love him. And, and, and he's beautiful, she answered, dancing lightly round him and flinging her arms in the air to, to the complete amazement of policeman, Uncle Felix, and her brother and sister in the bargain. There, you can see for yourself. The policeman stood aghast and stared. He drew a long, deep breath, whistled softly, and he pushed his big spike helmet back. He staggered. Uh, it seems there's a mistake, a kind of mistake somewhere, as it were. I... He stuck fast. He wiped his lips with his thick brown hand. Mistake everywhere, I... A uh, mistake everywhere, I think, said Uncle Felix sternly. Your mistake. The two men faced each other, for Uncle Felix had risen to his feet. The children held back and stared in silence. They were not quite sure what it was they saw. On Judy's face alone was a radiant confidence. Poor and placed the bedraggled and unkempt figure that had crawled beneath the sheet ten minutes before there rose before them, all apparently a tall young stripling, clean and white and shining as a fair Greek god. His hair was curly, he was dressed in gold, a silver sword hung down beside him, and his beardless face and beauty in it had made it radiant as a glad spring day. The sunlight was very dazzling just at that moment. You said, continued Uncle Felix in a voice of deadly quiet, the man you wanted had a wig of hair and a beard. A false beard? 
The policeman stared as though his eyes would drop out upon the tarpaulin. But he said no word. He consulted his notebook in a, a dazed, flustered kind of way. Then he looked up nervously at the astonishing figure of the tramp. Then looked back at his book again. And old, said Felix. And old, repeated the officer thickly, poring over the page. Uh, about fifty, I think you mentioned. About fifty, did I? He said it lightly, like a man not sure enough of a lesson that he ought to know by heart, but uh, disguised into the bargain. Uncle Felix raised his voice till it seemed to thunder out the words. Them was my instructions, sir, the officer was heard to mumble sulkily. Uncle Felix, to the children's immense delight and admiration, took a step nearer to the man of law. The latter moved slowly backwards, glancing half fiercely, half suspiciously, at the glorious figure of the person he expected to arrest as a dangerous thief and tramp. Okay. Yeah, I need to get to the end of this chapter and then I need to do something cuz I'm I'm sleepy. You know how it is reading sometimes. I've had a particularly long week, if I'll be honest. And following what you stupidly call your instructions, said Uncle Felix, looking sternly at him, you have broken in our gate, trespassed on our private property, disturbed our guests, and moved forcibly our tarpaulin from its rightful place. The crestfallen and amazed policeman gasped and raised his hands with a gesture of despair. He looked like a ruined man. There had been a handkerchief in his bulging coat he must have cried. You call yourself an officer of the law? boomed the defector of, defender of personal liberty. He went still nearer to him. His voice to the children sounds simply magnificent. A uniformed and, and salaried and representative of the government of England? Oh, oh, oh. you calls me or that? That's the wretched man in a trembling tone. I eat 25 shillings a week, that's all I know. Then there, ca there came a pause then while the man faced each other. Uncle, uncle, let him go, please. He couldn't help it, you know. He's a married man with a family, I expect, some day. A forgiving smile softened the features of both men at these gentle words. But this time, then, I won't report you, but don't let it occur again as long as you live. A day will come, perhaps, when you'll be under... When you will understand. Here, he added, holding out his hand with something in it, is another shilling to make it twenty-six. I advise you, if you're willing, if you're still open to friendly advice, to buy a pair of glasses. The discredited official took the shilling meekly and deposited it, and he would in, deposited it into his notebook. He cast one last hurried glance of amazement. He cast la one last hurried glance of amazement and suspicion at the man who had been beneath the tarpaulin and began to slink back ignominiously toward the gate. At last, the name, be the at last, that minute had turned. <sighs> oh. Oh, at the last minute he turned. Good evening, he said as he vanished into the road. Good evening, Uncle Felix answered behind him as he closed the gate. Then how it happened, no one knew exactly. Judy, walking up to the shining figure, took him by the hand and walked him slowly through the gate onto the long white road. There was a blaze of sunset pouring through the trees, and the shafts of, sh of slanting light made it difficult to see what everyone was doing. In the great commotion, he somehow vanished. The gate was closed, and Judy stood smiling and triumphant just inside upon the mossy path. 
You saved his life, said Sam. Oh, it's all right, she said, and burst into tears. The children are not so much impressed by the tears of others, knowing too well how easily they are produced and stopped. Tim went burrowing to find the bird, and Maria just mentioned that the tramp had taken the butter away in his pocket. By the time this fact was thoroughly re thoroughly established, the group was, what it, group was ready to leave, the tea things all collected, fire put out, and the sun dipping below the spot and below the dipping down below on top of the old gray fence. Then, and not till then, did the affair of the tramp come under discussion. What seemed most puzzling was why the policeman had not arrested him after all. They couldn't make it out at all. It seemed quite a mystery. There was something quite unusual about it altogether. Uncle Felix and Judy had been wonderful, but you see him blink when Judy went up and gave it to him? Yes, observed Maria, who had done nothing herself but stare. Did. The brother, however, was not so sure. I think, I think he believed her, declared with assurance, proud of her achievement. He really saw him young and with a sword and curly belt and all that. Judy looked at him with surprise. Her tears had ceased flowing by this time. Well, of course, didn't you? There was pain in her voice in addition to her blank astonishment. Of course we did, of course we did, said Uncle Felix, quickly with decision. As they went to the house, however, Uncle Felix lingered behind a moment as though he'd forgotten something. His face wore a puzzled expression. He seemed a little bewildered. He walked into the hat rack first, and then the umbrella stand, then stopped abruptly and put his hand to his head. Headache? asked Tim, who had been watching him. His uncle did not hear the question, or at least did not answer. Instead, he pulled something hurriedly out of his waistcoat pocket, held it to his ear, and listened attentively for a moment, then gave a sudden start. What was it? What is it, Uncle? Oh, nothing. My watch has stopped, that's all. He stood still a moment or two, reflecting deeply. His eyebrows went up and down, and he pursed his lips. Odd, he continued half to himself. They, I'm sure I wound up last night. It's only going it's only going again now if it stopped but only for a moment ah aha said tim significantly and looked about him he waited breathlessly he waited breathlessly for something more to happen but nothing did happen not just then only when at last Uncle Felix looked down, their eyes met, and a flash of knowledge too enormous to ever be forgotten passed noiselessly between the two of them. Perhaps, muttered his uncle, I wonder. And that was all. Okay, before we dive into chapter 11, I need to stand up and get my blood flowing and maybe make something to drink. Because this book is... I'm getting sleepy. I have not been sleeping abundantly well lately. My two lovely, lovely cats have been causing all sorts of problems. Haven't you, library? So, give me just a moment. <sighs> Sorry, you know I'm ordinarily pretty loath to... Uh, Go, go and stream while I'm tired. But I have I, I missed a bunch of paper cuts in a row, and I was kind of sick of it. So, I decided tonight was a good night for it. Oh. <sighs> While I'm standing and trying to wake up a little better, uh, how have you all's week been? 
as I said, I've been very busy of late. Uh, just busy, 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 this and that. Uh, catching up on um, backlogged work. That sort of thing. I'm very excited to finally finish all the stuff I've been uh, trying to catch up on, because then I can, you know, release all of that all, all at once. Uh, I know that's probably not the best thing for YouTube's sake, but... You know. Oh, dang it. This light is flickering. See, this is why I had the, uh, the alternative lighting system. The alternative lighting choices on earlier, because there is one lamp in here. There is one lamp in here that has been flickering something fierce every time I turn it on, and it's been driving me absolutely bonkers. Just really up a wall. And so I've been avoiding using it because, you know, with these modern LED fixture, fixtures, you gotta take the whole fixture out of the wall and acquire a new fixture that also fits. To replace the whole shebang. There is no just replace the light bulb anymore, apparently. And it drives me nuts because it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. LEDs last a good long time, but they don't last forever. <laughs> as as may be obvious, oh, this is much better lighting. Sorry, uh, clearly I needed to blow my nose. Now we shall see. Oh, that doesn't. Okay. <laughs> oh, that light is continuously flickering. I hope it did not come across that badly on video. Because if it does that I'm going to have to turn off my camera. Someone let me know if that flickering light right there comes across. Um, because if it's just bothering me, it's fine. But if you all can see it, that's an issue. You know how it is. Sorry, I'm, like, stalling a little bit. I'm trying to just be more awake. I've just been a very, a very sleepy person lately. I should not stall too long because uh, my car only spits out so much internet at a time. You know.
I gotta admit, I was uh, very tempted to get a Nintendo Switch Sports. But I think I'm gonna wait a little bit to see if uh see if anybody else is really uh really feeling it. Just because uh you know, I I love the Wii Sports, but I don't have a lot of room to play motion control type games around here. Anyway, before I get too distracted trying to be a little more awake, uh, you know, activating the information beam, let's dive into Chapter 11, Judy's Particular Adventure. Adventure means saying yes and being careless. Children say yes to everything and are very careless indeed. Even their no is usually a yes, inverted or deferred. I won't play, parsed by a, psycho parsed by a psychologist, means... I'll play when I'm ready. The adventurous spirit accepts what he, what offers, regardless of consequence. Uh, he who hesitates and thinks he is but a policeman who prevents adventure. Now everything offers itself to children. Because they rightly think that everything belongs to them. Life is conditionless, so to speak. Uh, if only people would let them accept it as it is. Don't think, accept, expresses the law of their swift and fluid being. They act on it. They take everything they can get. But it is the policeman who adds the get, changing the significance of life with one ugly syllable. Instead of... <laughs> to be clear, instead of... Because of the way I read that, it wasn't abundantly clear. They take everything they can get. That's how I should have read that line. Each of the children treasured an adventure of its very own, an adventure in chief that uh, could not possibly have happened to anybody else in the world. These three survivals in an age when education considers childhood a disease to be cured as hurriedly as possible took their adventure the instant that it came, and each with a complete assurance that it was unique. To no one else in the world could such a thing have happened, least of all to the other two. Each took it characteristically, according to his or her individual nature. Judy with a sense of romance called deathless. Tim with a taste for police dr or poetic drama, a dash of the supernatural in it. And Maria with a magnificent inactivity that ruled the world by waiting for things to happen, then claiming them as her own. Her masterly instinct for repose ran no risk of failure from misdirected energy. And to all three, secrecy, of course, was essential. Don't never tell the others, Uncle. Promise faithfully. For to every adventure, Uncle Felix acted was an, as an audience, an atmosphere, and a chorus. He watched whatever happened. Audience believed its reality atmosphere and explained without get, explaining away. Chorus. He had the unusual faculty of being ten years young as well as forty years old, and a real adventure was not possible without the secrecy, of course, was not preserved for long. Sooner or later, the glory must be shared so the others knew an enemy. For only then was the joy complete, the splendor pop properly fulfilled. And so the old tired world went round, and life grew more and more wonderful every day. For children are an epitome of life, a self-creating universe. That week was a memorable one for several reasons. Daddy, overworked among his sealing wax, went for a change to Switzerland, taking Mother with him. Aunt Emily, in her black silk dress that crackled with disapproval, went to Turnbridge, went to Turnbridge Wells, an awful, awful place in another century somewhere, and Uncle Felix was left behind to take charge of him. Um, being the children and himself, it was evidence of monumental trust and power placing him in their imaginations, even above the recognized authorities. His sway was never for a moment questioned. 
unfortunately, the sway of my internet over the stream is constantly in question. It's far too strong. Give me a moment to go fix that. Carrying too long. You know, just once, I would love to have one of these places have a good enough connection to the internet <laughs> to allow me to not have to get up once an hour and fix it. Really just a dire inconvenience. <laughs> yeah, we barely made it an hour and then the internet was like, no, I'm going to bed. I'm going to sleep. It's like, no. <laughs> oh. No lessons then, he had insisted, as a condition of acceptance. And after much confabulation, the point was yielded with reluctance. It was to be a fortnight's holiday all round. They had the house and grounds entirely to themselves, and with the departure of the elders, a sheet was pulled by someone off the world, a curtain rolled away, another drop scene fell, the word no disappeared, and they saw invisible things. Another reason, however, made the week memorable. The daisies. It was extraordinary. The very day after the grown-ups had left, uh, the daisies came. Like thousands of small white birds with bright and steady eyes, they arrived and settled, thick and plentiful. They appeared in sheets and crowds upon the grass, all of their own, all of their own accord and unexplained. In a night the lawns turned white. It seemed a prearranged invasion. Judy, first awake that morning, looked out of her window to watch a squirrel playing, and noticed them. Then she told the others, and Maria, one eye above the blankets, ejaculated an Ah She claimed the daisies too. Now, whereas a single daisy has no smell and seems a common, unimportant thing, a bunch of several hundred holds all the perfume of the spring. No flowers lie closer to the soil or bring the smell of earth more sweetly to mind. Upon the lips and cheeks they are as soft as a kitten's fur and lie against the skin closer than tired eyelids. They are the common people of the flower world, yet have, in virtue of that fact, the beauty and simplicity of the common people. They own a subdued and unostentatious strength, are humbled and ignored, are walked upon, unnoticed, rarely thought about, and never praised. They're cut off in early youth by mowing machines, yet their pain and fading is unreported, their little sufferings unsung. They cling to earth and never aspire to climb, but they hold the sweetest dew and nurse the tiniest little winds imaginable. Their patience is divine. They're proud to be the carpet for all walking, running things. And in their universal service is their strength. The rain stays longer with them than with greater flowers, and the best sunlight goes to sleep among them in great pools of fragrant and delicious heat. The daisies are stalwart little people all together. But they have another quality as well, something elfin, wayward, mischievous. They peep and whisper. It's said they can cast spells. To sleep upon a daisied lawn is to run a certain risk. There is this hint of impudence in their attitude, half audacity, half knavery, that shows itself a little in the way they stare unwinkingly all day at everything above them. The stately things that tower proudly in the air, then just shut up at sunset without a word of explanation or apology. They see everything but keep their opinions to themselves. 
because people notice them so little, and even tread upon their tiny and inquiring faces, they are up to things all the time, undiscovered things. They know, it is said, the thoughts of painted ladies and clouded brimstones, as well as the intentions of the disappearing golden flies. Why wind often runs close to the ground when the treetops are without a single breath, but also they know what is going on below the surface. They live, moreover, in every country of the globe, and their system of intercommunication is so perfect that even birds and flying things can learn from them. They prove their breeding by their perfect taste in dress, the well-bred ever being inconspicuous, and their simplicity conceals enormous, undecipherable wonder. One daisy out of doors is worth a hundred shelves of textbooks in the house. Their mischief, moreover, isn't revenge, though some might think it so, but a natural desire to be recognized, thought, and talked about a little. Daisies, in a word, are daisies. And it was by the way of the daisies that Judy's great adventure came to her, a particular adventure that it was her very own. She had deep sympathy with the flowers, a sympathy lacking in her brother and sister, and it was natural that her adventure in chief should come that way. She could play with flowers for long periods at a time. She knew their names and habits. She picked them gently, without cruelty, and never merely for the fun of picking them. While the way she arranged them about the house proved that she understood their silent inner natures, their likes and dislikes, in a word, their souls. For Judy connected them in her mind with birds. Born in the air, they seemed to her. As has been seen... She was the first to notice the arrival of the daisies. From the bedroom window she waved her arm to them and showed plainly the pleasure that she felt. They arrived in troops and armies. Risen to the surface of the lawn like cream, she saw them staring with suspicious innocence at the sky. They stared at her. Just when have the others gone away? Or just when the others have gone away? was her instant thought, though unexpressed in words. There was meaning somewhere in this calculated arrival. They are alive, she asked that afternoon, aren't they? But why do they all shut up at night? Who? What closes them? She was alone with Uncle Felix, and they had chosen with great difficulty a spot where they could lie down without crushing a single flower with their enormous bodies. After a considerable difficulty, they had found it. Having done a great many things since lunch, a feast involving several second helpings, they were feeling heavy and exhausted. So Judy chose this moment for her simple question. The world required explanation. Oh, there, there's life and everything, he mumbled, his face against the grass. Everything that grows, especially. And having said it, he settled down comfortably again to doze. His pipe was out. He felt rather like a log. But, but stopping growing, or, but stopping growing isn't dying, she informed him sharply. Oh, no. You were alive for a long time after that. You stopped growing before I was born. And I'm not quite dead yet. Exactly, so daisies are alive. It was absurd to think of dozing at such a time. He rolled around heavily and gazed at her through half-closed eyelids. A uh, daisy breathes and drinks and eats. Sap circulates in its little body. Probably it feels as well. Delicate threads like nerves run through it everywhere. It knows when it's being picked or walked on. Oh, yes, a daisy's alive all right enough. He sighed like a big dog that's just shaken a fly off its nose and lies waiting for the next attack. It came at once. But who knows it? I mean, there's no good in being alive unless someone else knows it, too. Then he sat up and stared at her. Judy, he remembered, knew a lot of things she could tell to no one, not even to herself. And this seemed one of them. The question was startling. <laughs> An intellectual mystic at twelve, how on earth did you manage it? I may be a mistellectual insect, she replied, proud of the compliment. But what's the good of being alive, even like a daisy, when, unless others know it? Us, for example. She, he sat still, stared at her, sitting up stiffly and propped by his hands upon the grass behind him. After prolonged reflection during which he closed his eyes and opened them several times in succession. Sighing laboriously while he did so, low mumbled words became audible. Uh, for 
forgive my apparent slowness, but I feel like a mowing machine this afternoon. I want oiling and pushing. The answer to your inquiry, however, is as follows. We could, if we took the trouble. Could know that the daisies are alive? His great head nodded. If we thought of if we thought about them very hard indeed, and for a very very long time, we could feel as they feel, and so understand them and know exactly how they are alive. And the way he said it, the grave, thoughtful, solemn way, convinced her that, who convinced her, who was already convinced beforehand. I do believe we could. I'm sure of it. Let's try. For a minute and a half, they stared into each other's eyes, knowing themselves balanced upon the verge of an immense discovery. She did not doubt nor question. She didn't tell him that he was only humble. Her heart thrilled with the right conditions, expectation, and delight. Her dark brown eyes were burning. He, mumbled, he murmured something she didn't properly understand. Expect and delight is the way to invite. Delight and expect and you'll know things direct. Let's try, she repeated, and her face proved that she fulfilled his conditions without knowing it. She was delighted, and she expected everything. He scratched his head, wrinkling up his nose and pursing his lips for a moment. There's a dodge about it. To know a flower yourself, you must feel exactly like it. Its life, you see, is different to ours. It doesn't move or hurry, just lives. It feels sun and wind and dew. It feels the insect's tread. It lifts its skin to meet the raindrops and the whispering butterflies. It doesn't run away. It has no fear of anything, because it has the whole, whole green earth behind it. And it feels safe because the millions of other daisies feel the same. And it smells because it's happy. And what is a daisy? What is it really? She was expecting vividly. I was expecting my phone to remain quiet this fine evening, and it did not. Alas. Anyway, uh, she was expecting vividly. Her mind was hungry for essentials. This mere description told her nothing real. She wanted to feel direct. What is a daisy? The little word already had a wonderful and living sound. Soft, sweet, and beautiful. But to tell the truth about this ordinary masterpiece was no easy matter. An ostentatious lily, a blazing rose, a wayward hyacinth, a mass of showy wisteria advertised and notorious flowers presented fewer difficulties. A daisy seemed too simple to be told, its mystery and honor too humble for proud human minds to understand. And so he answered gently while a marble white sailed past between while the marble white sailed past between their very faces. Let's think about it hard. Perhaps we'll get it that way. The butterfly sailed off across the lawn, another joined it, and then a third. They danced and flitted like winged marionettes on wires that the swallows tweaked, and as they vanished, a breath of scented air stole round the trunk of the big lime tree and stirred the daisies' heads. A thousand small white faces turned toward them, a thousand steady eyes observed them, a thousand slender necks were bent. A wave of movement passed across the lawn, as though the flowers pressed nearer, aware at last they were being noticed. And both humans, the big one and the little one, felt a sudden thrill of happiness and beauty in their hearts. The rapture of the spring slipped into them. They concentrated all their thoughts on daisies. I'm beginning to feel it already, whispered the little human, turning to gaze at him as though that breath of air impelled her too. The wind blew her voice across his face like perfume. He looked, but could not see her clearly. She swayed a little. Her eyes melted together into a single lovely circle, bright and steady within their fringe of feathery lashes. He tried to speak, to delight and expect, and will know it direct. But his voice spread across whole yards of lawn. It became a single word that rolled and floated everywhere about him, rising and falling like a wave upon a sea of green. Daisy, daisy, daisy. On all sides, beneath, above his head as well, 
It passed with the music of the wandering wind, and he kept repeating it. Days. Days. She kept repeating it, too, till the sound amplified, yet never grew louder than a murmur of air and grass and tiny leaves. Daisy, Daisy, Daisy. It broke like a sea upon the coastline of another world. It seemed to contain an entire language in itself, nothing more to be said but those two soft syllables. It was everywhere. I'll have to excuse my wobbling around. I'm like, ooh, wind. I would also like to feel the wind. <laughs> uh, where was it? But another vaster sound lay underneath. As the crest of a breaking wave utters its separate note of foam above the general booming of the sea that, he, that bears it, so the flying wave of daisy tones arose out of this deeper sound beneath. Both humans became aware that it was but a surface world they imitated, or rather a surface voice they imitated. They heard this other foundation sound that bore it, deep, booming, thunderous, half lost and very far away. It was prodigious, yet there was safety and delight in it that brought no hint of fear. They swam upon the pulse of some enormous, gentle life that rose about and threw them in a swelling tide. They felt the heave of something that was strong enough to draw the moon, yet soft enough to close a daisy's eyes. They heard the deep, lost roar of it rising and coming nearer. The earth, he whispered. The spring is rising through it. Listen. We're growing together, replied the little human. We're rising with the spring. Oh, it was exquisite. They were in the daisy world. He tried to move to reach her but found that he could not take a step in any direction, and his feet were embedded in the soft, damp soil. The movement which he tried to make spread wide, among a hundred others like himself. They rose on every side. All shared his movements as they had shared his voice. He heard his whole body murmuring, Daisy, Daisy, Daisy. And she leaned over, bending towards him a slim form, in a graceful line of green that formed the segment of a circle. A little shining face came close for a moment against his own, rimmed with delicate spears of pink and white. It sang as it shone. The spring was in it. There were hundreds like it everywhere, yet he recognized it as one he knew. There were thousands, tens of thousands, yet this one he distinguished because he loved it. Their faces touched like the fringes of two clouds, and then withdrew. They remained very close together, side by side among thousands like themselves, slowly rising on that same great tide. The earth's round body was beneath them. They felt quite safe, but different. Already they were otherwise than they had been. They had felt the big world flying. We were changing, he murmured, seizing some fragments of half-remembered speech. We marvelously changed. Daisies, he heard her vanishing reply. We're two daisies on a lawn. And then their voices went. That was the end of speech, the end of thinking, too. They only felt. Long periods passed above their heads, and then the air about them turned gorgeous as a sunset sky. It was a clouded yellow that sailed lazily past their faces, with spreading wings as large as clouds. They shared that saffron glory. The draught of cool air fanned them. The splendid butterfly left its beauty in them before it sailed away. But that sunset sky had lasted for hours. That cool wind fanning them was a breeze that blew steadily from the hills, making weather for half an afternoon. Time and duration as humans measure them had passed away. There was existence without hurry. End and beginning had not been invented yet. They did not know things in the stupid sense of having names for them. All, there w all that there was, they shared. That was enough. They knew by feeling. For everything was plentiful and inexhaustible. The heavens emptied light and warmth upon them without stint or measure. Space poured about them freely, for they had no wish to move. They felt themselves everywhere, for they all needed, for all they needed came to them without the painful effort of busy things that hunt and search outside themselves. 
both food and drink slipped into them, unawares from an abundant source below, that equally supplied whole forests without a trace of lessening our loss. All life was theirs, full, free, and generous beyond conception. They owned the world without even the trouble of knowing that they owned it. They lived, simply staring at the universe with eyes of exquisitely fashioned beauty. They knew joy and peace, and were content with that. They did communicate. Oh, yes, they shared each other's special happiness. There was, it is true, no sound of broken syllables, no speech which humans used to veil the very thing they would express. But there was that simpler language which all nature knows, which cannot lie, because it's unconscious, and by which constellations converse with buttercups, and cedars with the flying drops of rain, there was gesture. For gesture and attitude can convey all the important and necessary things, while speech in the human sense is but an invention of some sprite who wanted people to wonder what they really meant. In sublimest moments it is never used, even in the best circles of intelligence. It drops away quite naturally. Souls know one another to face in dumb but eloquent gesture. The sun is out. I feel warm and happy. There's nothing in the world I need. Oh, that's, that's, the, that's the girl. When the sun is out, I feel warm and happy. There's nothing in the world I need. You are beside me. I love you, and we cannot go far apart. I smell you even when no wind stirs. You are sweetest when the dew has gone and left you moist and shine. A little shiver of enjoyment quivered through her curving stem. His petals brushed her own, and she answered, But are fine, we stand together, and never stop staring at each other till we close our faces in the long darkness. But even then we whisper as we grow, and open our eyes together at the same moment when light comes back, and feel warm and soft and smell more delicious than ever in the dawn. These two brave daisies growing on the lawn had lives of concentrated happiness, asking no pity for their humble station in the universe. All treated them with unadulterated respect, and everything made love to them because they were so tender, so easily pleased. They knew, for instance, that their splendid earth was turning with them, for they, helped, they, they felt the swerve of her, sharing from their roots upwards her gigantic curve through space. They knew the sun was part of them because they felt it drawing their sweet-flavored food up their dainty length until it glowed in health upon their small, flushed faces. Also they knew that streams of water made a tumbling fuss and sent them messages of laughter because they caught the little rumble of it through miles of trembling ground. And some among them, though these were prophets and poets, but half-believed, and looked upon as partly mad, partly wonderful, affirmed that they felt the sea itself, far leagues away, bending their heads this way and that for hours at a stretch, according to a thundering vibration that the tides sent through the soil from distant shores. But all, from the tallest spread head to the smallest button face, all knew the pleasure of uncertain winds, all knew the game of holding flying things just a moment longer by fascinating them, by drowsing them into sleepiness, by nipping their proboscises, or puffing perfume into their nostrils while they caught their feet with the pressure of a hundred yellow rods. Enormous periods passed away. The cloud that for a man's ten minutes hid the sun wearied them so that they simply closed their eyes and went to sleep. Showers of rain they loved because it washed and cooled them, they felt the huge satisfaction of the earth beneath them as it drank, the sweet sensation of wet soil that, sp that spun to their roots, the pleasant gush that sluiced their bodies and carried off all the irritating dust. They also felt the heavier tumbling of a swollen stream in all directions. And the drops from overhanging trees came down and played with them, bringing another set of perfumes altogether. A summer shower was, of course, a month to them, a day of rain like weeks of holiday by the sea. But most of all, they enjoyed the rough and tumble nonsense of the violent weather, when they were tied together by the ropes of running wind, for these were visiting days. All manner of strangers dropped in upon them from distant walks in life, and they never knew whether the next would be a fur cone or one of those careless and irresponsible travelers, a bit of thistle-down. Yet for all their steadiness they knew incessant change. 
the variety of a daisy's existence was proverbial, nor was the surprise of being walked upon too alarming. It didn't come to all, after all, for they had a way of bending beneath enormous pressure so that nothing broke, while well, sometimes it brought a strange, delicious pleasure, as when the bare feet of some flying child passed lightly over them, leaving wild laughter upon a group of them. They knew, indeed, a thousand joys, proudest of all. However, er, they knew, indeed, a thousand joys. Proudest of all, however, that the big earth loved them so that she carried millions of them wherever she went. And all, without exception, communicated their knowledge by the movements, attitudes, and gestures they assumed. And since each stood, and since each stood close to each, the enjoyment spread quickly till the entire lawn felt one undivided sensation by itself. Anything passing across it at such a moment, whether insect, bird, loose leaf, or even hum human being, would be aware of this, and thus, for a fleeting second, share another world. Poets, it said, have received their sweetest inspirations upon a daisy lawn in a flush of spring. Nor is it always a sight of prey that makes the swallows dart so suddenly sideways and away, but rather some chance message of joy or warning, intercepted from the hosts of the flowers in the soil. And from this region of the flower life comes, of course, the legend that fairies have emotions that last forever, with eternal youth and with loves that do not pass away to die. They too, this too, they understood because the measurement of existence is a mightier business than with overdeveloped humans in a hurry. For knowledge comes chiefly through the eye, and the eye can perceive only six times in a second. Things that happen more quickly or more slowly than six times a second are invisible. No man can see the movement of a growing daisy, just as no man can distinguish the separate beats of a sparrow's wing. One is too slow, and the other is too quick. But the daisy is practically all eye. It is aware of most delightful things. In its short life of months, it lives through an eternity of unhurrying perceptions and of big sensations. Its youth, its loves, its pleasures are to it quite endless. I can see the old sun moving, but you will love me forever, won't you? Even till it sinks behind the hills. He answered, I shall not change. So long we have been friends already. You remember when we first met each other, and you looked into my opening eyes? He sighed with joy as he thought of the long, long stretch of time. That was in our first reckless youth, he answered, catching the gold of passionate remembrance from an amber fly that hovered for an instant and was gone. I remember well. You were half hidden by a drop of hanging dew, but I discovered you. That lilac bud across the world was just beginning to open. And, held by the wind, he, belt, he bent his shining head, taller than hers by the sixtieth part of an inch, toward the lilac trees beside the gravel path. So long ago as that, she murmured, happy with the exquisite belief in him. But you'll never change or leave me. Promise, oh, promise that. His stalk grew nearer to her own. He leaned protectively toward her eager face. Sorry, the library decided it was a great idea to type things. You don't have to lay on the phone, bud. You can just lay right there. Yeah. Until that bud shall open fully to the light and smell its sweetest, he replied, the gesture of his petal told it plainly. So long shall you and I enjoy our happy love. And it was an eternity to them. Longer still. And longer still, even until the blossom falls. He whispered all this in the wind. It was good to be alive with such an age of happiness before them. He felt the tears in her voice, however. He knew there was something she longed to tell. What's your sadness? Why do you put such questions to me now? What's your little trouble? A moment's hesitation, a moment's hanging of the graceful head, the width of a petal's top nearer to his shoulder. Then she told him, I was in darkness for a long time. It was a long, long time. It seemed that something came between us. I lost your face. I felt afraid. And his laughter, for just then a puff of wind passed by and shook his sides for him, 
ran across many feet of lawn. <laughs> it was a bumblebee. Came between us for a bit. Its shadow fell upon you. Nothing more. Such things will happen. We must be prepared for them. It was nothing in myself that dimmed your world. Another time I'll be braver then, she told him. And even in the darkness I shall hold you close. Oh, we're very close to me. For a long, long stretch of time then, they stood joyfully together and watched the lilac growing. They also saw the movement of the sun across the sky, and eternity passed over them. The vast disk of the sun went slowly gliding. But all the enormous things that happened in their lives cannot be told. Lives crammed with a succession of such grand and palpitating adventures lie beyond the reach of clumsy words. The sweetness sometimes was intolerable, then they shared it with the entire lawn, and so obtained relief, yet merely in order to begin again. The humming of the rising spring continued with the thunderous droning of the turning earth. Ever uncared for, part of everything, full of the big, rich life that brims the world in May, oh, almost fuller than they could hold sometimes, they passed with existence along to their appointed end. It began so long ago, I simply can't remember it. And yet the sun they watched had not left half a degree behind him since they met. There was no beginning, he reproved her, smiling. There will never be any end. And the winds spread their happiness like perfume everywhere, till the whole white lawn of daisies lay singing their rapture to the sunshine. The minute underworld of grass and stalks seemed of a sudden to grow large, yet until now they had not realized it as large, but simply natural. A beetle, big and broad as a Newfoundland dog, went lumbering past them, brushing its polished back against their trembling necks. Yet till now they had not thought of it as big, but simply normal. Its footsteps made a grating sound like the gardener's nailed boots upon the graveled paths. It was strange and startling. Something was different. Something was changing. They realized dimly that there was another world somewhere, a world that they had left behind long, long ago, forgotten. Something was slipping from him, as sleep slips from the skin and eyes in the early morning when the bath comes peeing upon the floor. What did it mean? Big and little, far and near, above, below, inside and outside, all were mixed together in a falling rush. They themselves were changing. They looked up. They saw an enormous thing rising behind them, with vast caverns of square outline opening inside. A house. They saw huge towering shapes whose tops were in the clouds. The familiar lime trees, big and tiny, were in inextricably mixed together. And that was wrong, for either the forest of grass was as big as themselves, in which case they were still daisies, or else it was tiny and far below them, in which case they were hurrying humans again. It was an odd confusion, while consciousness swung home in its appointed center, an adventure brought them back toward the old familiar starting place again. There came an ominous and portentous sound that rushed towards them through the air, and through the solid ground as well. They heard it, and grew pale with terror. Across the entire lawn it rumbled nearer, growing in volume awfully. The very earth seemed breaking into bits about them, and then they knew. It was the end of the world that their prophets had long foretold. It crashed upon them before they had time to think. The roar was appalling. The whole lawn trembled. The daisies bowed their little faces in a crowd. They had no time even to close their innocent eyes. Before a quarter of their sweet and happy life was known, the end swept them from the world unsung and unlamented. Two of them who had planned eternity together fell side by side before one terrible stroke. I do believe, said Judy, brushing her tumbled hair out of her eyes. Not possible, exclaimed Uncle Felix, sitting up and stretching himself like a dog. It's a thing I do never, never. I think my stupid watch has stopped again. They stared at each other with suspiciously sleepy eyes. Promise. Promise never to tell the others. I promise faithfully. But we'd better get up or we shall have our heads cut off like all the other daisies. He pulled her to her feet, out of the way of the heavy mowing machine, which Whedon was pushing with a whirring, 
droning noise across the lawn. These really are. That was like. That was a remarkable passage just then. That was like. That's something I. I um, sorry, I, I don't have. I don't quite have the my words in order to describe that felt kind of like surrealist you could feel the author trying to lend a sense of personhood and thoughtfulness to all of nature which i find fascinating there's this deep sense of wonder really just suffused throughout this book that I think is what's having me come back to it so happily. All right, let's see what, uh, let's dive into the next chapter, chapter 12, and see what Tim's particular adventure is. Tim's particular adventure was of another kind. It was a self-repeater of some violence, moreover, when the smallness of the hero is considered. Whether in afterlife he became an astronomer poet or a silver and mechanical engineer, of both dreams of his, he will ever be sharp upon rescuing something. A lost star or a burning mine will be his objective, but with the essential condition that it be unattainable. Achievement would mean lost interest, for Tim's desire was, is, and ever will be insatiable. Profoundest mystery, insoluble difficulty, and endless searching were what his soul demanded of life. For him all pawns were bottomless, all, all travelers older than the moon. He felt the universe within him and was born to seek its inexplicable explanation outside. The realization of such passion, however, is not necessarily confined to writers of epics and lyrics. Tim was a man of action before he was a poet, for ever questing was his unacknowledged motto. Besides asking... Besides asking questions about stars and other inaccessible incidents of the cosmos, he liked to uh, he liked to go busting about, as he called it, again with one essential condition that the thing should never come to an end by merely happening. Its mystery must remain its beauty. I want to save something from an awful, horrible death. He announced to an evening, looking up from half hours with English battles for a sign of beauty and distress. Oh, not so easy, his uncle warned him, equally weary of another overrated book, his own. But I feel like it. Come on. Uncle Felix still held back. But you feel like it doesn't prove that there's anything that wants rescuing, he objected. The boy stared at him with patient tolerance and surprise. I promised was the other's turn to stare. And when, pray? They had been alone for the last half hour, and it had seemed strange. Oh, just now, a few minutes ago, about. Indeed. It seemed stranger still. No one had come in, yet Tim had never prevaricated. Yes, I gave my wordy honor. It was so gravely spoken that while pledges involving life and death were obviously not new to him, this one of his was of a sec... A, a, while pledges involving life and death were obviously not new to him, this one was of, of an... Can I speak English? I've been reading for the past hour and a half. Can I please speak English? It was so gravely spoken that while pledges involving life and death were obviously not new to him, this one was, a, was of exceptional kind. Who then did you promise? Whom, I mean? man demanded, fixing him with his stern blue eyes. The answer came out pat. Myself! Aha! Uh -huh, said the other, with a sigh and raising the eyebrows, by way of apology. Well, that settles it. Of course. Because what you think and say, you, uh, you must also act. If you do promise yourself a thing, and then don't do it, you've simply told a lie. And he drew another sigh. He scented action coming. Let's go at once and find it, said Tim, putting a textbook into seven words. He hitched his belt up and looked round to make sure his sisters were not within reach of interference. 
There was a moment's pause during which Uncle Felix hitched his will up. They arose then, standing side by side. They left the room arm in arm on their way into the garden. The dusk was already laying in its first net of shadows to catch the night. Hadn't you better change first? Tim said thoughtfully on his way down. He glanced at his companion's white flannel suit. You're so awfully visible. <laughs> visible? It was not his bulk. Tim was never deliberately rude. Was it the risk of staining that he meant? Anyone can see miles away like that. The other understood intently. An adventure, everything sees, everything has eyes, everything watches. The world is alive and full of eyes. He hesitated a moment. Oh, that's right. To be easily seen is the best way. It disarms curiosity at once. Tell all about yourself and nobody ever thinks anything. It's trying to hide that makes the world suspect you. Keep nothing back and show yourself is the best way to go about unnoticed. I've tried it. Oh, exclaimed Tim in an eager whisper. Same as walking into the strawberry bed without asking. So my white clothes are just the thing, said the other, avoiding the pit laid for him. Of course, yes. Tim still chased the big idea in his mind. Besides, he added, full of another splendid thought, like what they won't expect. Like that they won't expect you to do very much. They'll watch you instead of me. There was confusion in the utterance, but things were rather crowding in upon him, to tell the truth, and imagination leaped ahead upon two trails at once. He looked at his big companion with more approval. You'll do, he signified, pulling his cap over his eyes, thrusting both hands in his pockets, and slithering rapidly down the banisters in advance. Thanks, said Uncle Felix, following him three steps at a time with effort. In the hall they paused a moment, a question of doors. Back? Brent's better, and nobody'll think anything, you see. He was quick to put the new principle into practice. On the lawn there was another pause, this time a question of direction. The wood, of course. And they set off together at a steady trot. Few words were wasted when Tim went bustling about in this way. Uncle Felix resigned himself and looked to him for guidance. There was some one to be rescued. There was danger to be run. The risk was bigger than either of them realized, but more than that he knew not. Got a handkerchief with you? Yes, thanks. Got everything. For signaling. We was offered three minutes later by way of explanation. In case we get lost or anything like that. Quite so. Is it a clean one? Yes. Good. They climbed the swinging gate of iron, rushed to the orchard, crossed the smaller hayfield in the open, heedless of the rabbits that rolled like fat balls into pockets made to fit them, slipped out of sight behind a stack of straw whose threatening lopsidedness seemed to support a ladder, and so eventually came to a breathless and perspiring halt upon the edges of a wood. It was a very ordinary wood, small, inconspicuous, and un unimposing, no thick trees towered, there was no fence of thick black trunks. It wasn't mysterious like the dense evergreens on the other side of the grounds, where the west wind shook half a mile of dripping branches in stormy weather. Where the yew trees are gigantic, and the yellow coast of Spain, resting on the dim Atlantic, stores the undesired rain. It grew there in a kind of untidy muddle, on the very outskirts of the estate, meekly, Rather disappointingly, Uncle Felix thought. There was no hint of anything haunted or terrible about it. Round rabbits fussed busily about its edges, darting as though pulled by wires, and the older wood pigeons, no doubt, slept comfortably in its middle. But the game despised it heartily, and traps were never laid. It was not even a trespasser's board, without which no wood is properly attractive. Indeed, for most people, it was simply not worth the trouble of entering at all. Apparently, no one ever bothered about it. Yet, precisely for these very reasons, it was real. Tim described it afterwards as a naked wood. It had no fence to hold it together. It was not dressed up by human beings. It just grew naturally. To this very openness and want of concealment, it owed its deep security. Its safety was due entirely to the air of innocence it wore. But in reality, it was disguised. It was a forest, without a middle, without a heart. This is our wood, 
announced Tim in a low voice as they stood and mopped their faces. His tones suggested they would enter at their peril. Uh, is it a big wood? The other asked with caution, as though he had not noticed it before. Much bigger than it looks, you can easily get lost, then added with the first touch of awe about it. It has no center. Oh, that's the worst kind. His companion shivered slightly, like a pond that has no bottom. Tim nodded. His face had grown a trifle paler. He showed no immediate anxiety to make the first advance, reserving that privilege for his first comrade. A breath of wind stole out and set the dry leaves rustling. We must look out. There will be a sign. Uncle Felix listened attentively to every word. The boy moved closer up to him. If anything happens, one of us must climb a tree and signal. You've got the clean handkerchief. See, it's at the center where it gets rather nasty. Anybody who gets there simply disappears. You're never heard of again. That's why there's no center at all, really. It's a terrible rescue we've got to do. The adventurer fulfilled the desire of his heart, for since there was no center, the search would last forever. Uh, keep a sharp lookout for the sign, replied the man, feeling a small hand steal into his own. We'd better go in before it gets any darker. Oh, that's nothing. The great thing is not to lose our way. Just follow me. Then they went into this wood without a center, without a middle, without a heart. Into this heartless wood they moved stealthily, Uncle Felix singing under his breath to keep his courage up. A wood is a mysterious place. It never looks you in the face. But stares behind you all the time. Your safest plan is just to climb. For otherwise you lose your way. The week, the month, the time of day. It turns you round. It makes you blind. And in the end you lose your mind. Avoid the center if you enter. It grows upon you, grows immense. Its peace is not indifference. It sees you and it takes offense. It knows you're interfering. Its sleepiness is all pretense, with, tr with trunks and twigs and foliage dense. It's watching you, alert and tense. It's furious, it's peering. Upon the darkening paths below, whichever way you try to go, you'll meet with strange resistance. So climb a tree and wave your hand. The birds will see and understand, and may bring you assistance. Avoid the center if you enter, for once you're there, you disappear, smothered by depth and distance. Tim listened without a sign of interest. Everyone has his peculiarity, he supposed, and provided his companion didn't dance as well as sing, it was all right. The noise was unnecessary, perhaps, but the sound of a human voice was not without its charm. The house was a very long way off. The gardeners never came this way. A wood was a mysterious place. Is that all? he asked, but whether glad or sorry, no man could have possibly told. Uh, for the pe for the present, came the reply, and the sound of both their voices fell a little, a little dead, muffled by the density of the overgrowth. We going right? There will be a sign. And the way he said it, the air of positive belief in tone and manner, strung the man's consciousness with a thrill of genuine adventure. It began to creep over him. He kept near to the comforting presence of the boy, aware in quite a novel way of the presence of the wood. This very ordinary wood, without claim to particular notice, much less to a notice board, changed his normal feelings by arresting their customary flow. An unusual sensation replaced what he was meant to feel, expected to feel. He was aware of strangeness. He felt included in the purpose of a crowd of growing trees. But it's just a common little wood, he assured himself, realizing that it is, as he said it, both adjectives were wrong. For nothing left to itself is ever common, and as for little, well, it suddenly had become enormous. Outside, in what was called the big world, things were going on with frantic hurry and change, but in here the leisured calm was huge, gigantic so much so that the other dwindled into a kind of lost remoteness. Smothered by depth and distance, he could almost forget it altogether. Out there, nations were at war, republics fighting, empires tottering to ruin, great-hearted ladies were burning furniture and stabbing lovely pictures, not their own, to prove themselves intelligent enough to vote. 
gallant gentlemen were flying across the Alps and hunting for the top and bottom of the earth instead of hurrying to help them. All manner of tremendous things were happening at a frightful pace, while this unnoticed wood just stood and grew, watching the sun and stars and listening to the brushing winds. Its unadvertised foliage concealed a busy universe of multitudinous secret life. How still the trees were, far more imposing than in a storm. Still, quiet things are much more impressive than things that draw attention to themselves by making, by making a noise. They're more articulate. The strength of these trees emerged in their silence. Their steadiness might easily wear one down. And now, into its quiet presence, a man and a boy from that distressful outer world had entered. They moved with effort and difficulty into its untrodden depths. Uninvited and unasked, they sought its hidden and invisible center, the mysterious heart of it which the younger of the adventurers could only describe by saying that it isn't there, because when you get there you disappear. Two ways of expressing the same thing, of course. Moreover, entering involved getting out again. Escape and rescue, the wood always in opposition, took possession of the man's slow mind. It was already thick about them, and the trees stood very still. The branches dropped, or the branches drooped, motionless in the warm evening air. The twigs pointed. Each leaf had an eye, but a hidden, lidless eye. The saplings saw them, but the heavier trunks observed them. It was known in what direction they were going. The direction, however, being chosen and insisted upon by the wood. Their very steps were counted. The whole business of the trees was suspended while they passed. They were being watched. And the stillness was so deep that it forced them, too, to make as little noise as possible. They moved with the utmost caution, pretending that a snapping twig might betray their presence, yet knowing quite well that each detail of their blundering advance was marked down with the accuracy of an instantaneous photograph. Tim, usually in advance, looked round from time to time with a finger on his lips, and though he himself made far more noise than his companion, he stared with reproach when the latter snapped a stick or let a leafy branch swish through the air too loudly. Oh, hush! Please do hush! And at the same moment caught his own foot in a root, placed cunningly across the path, and sprawled for forward with the noise of an explosion, but he made no reference to the matter. His own noises did no harm, apparently. He was perfectly honest about it, not merely putting the blame elsewhere to draw attention from himself. His uncle's size and visibility were co-related in his mind. Being convinced that he moved as stealthily and soundlessly as a redskin, it followed, obviously, that his companion did the dusk had noticeably deepened when, at length, they reached a little clearing and stood upright, perspiring freely and both a little flustered. The silence was really extraordinary. It seemed they had entered a private place, a secret chamber, where they had no right and were intruders. The clearing formed a circle, and from the open sky overhead a grey, mysterious light fell softly on the leafy walls. They paused and peered about them. Hark! What's that? Nothing. But I heard it. Something rushing. I'm out of breath, perhaps. The boy looked at him reproachfully. His expression suggested, Why are you so noisy and enormous? It's hopeless, really. But aloud, he merely said, It's got awfully dark of all of a sudden. Oh, it's the wood that does that. Outside, it's only twilight. I think we'd be better getting on. We're we getting there. But well, we shan't be able to see the sign if this darkness gets worse. It, it's been ages and ages ago. The idea of rescue, meanwhile, had merged insensibly into escape, but neither remarked upon the change. It was only that the original emotion had spread a, bit, spread a bit. Tim and Uncle Felix stood close together in this solemn clearing, waiting, peering about them, listening intently. But Tim had seen the sign. He knew what he was doing all the time. He was in more intimate relations with the being of the wood than his great floundering uncle possibly could be. Which way? Which way, do you think? asked the latter anxiously. There seemed no possible exit from the clearing, no break anywhere in the leafy walls. Even the entrance was covered up and hidden. 
The wood blocked further advance deliberately. We're lost, said Tim bluntly, turning round and round, and his eyes opened to their widest. You've simply taken a wrong turning somewhere. And before Uncle Felix could expostulate or say a word in his self-defense, the inevitable reward of his mistake was upon him. You've got the handkerchief. Already the boy was looking about him for a suitable tree. But you saw the sign, Tim. It's your wood. I've never been here before. That one looks the easiest, suggested Tim, pointing to a beach. It had one low branch, but the trunk was smooth and slippery as ice. He pushed aside the foliage with his hands to make an opening towards it. I'll help you up. Tim spoke as there was no time to lose. But help came just then from an unexpectedly another quarter. It was sudden battering sound. Something went past them through the branches with a crashing noise. It was terrific, the way it smashed and clattered overhead, making a clapping rattle that died away into the distance with strange swiftness. They jumped, their hearts stood still for a moment. It was so horribly close. But the stillness that followed the uproar was far worse than the noise. It felt as though the wood had stretched a hand and aimed a crafty blow at them from behind the shield of foliage. A quiver of visible silence ran across the leafy walls. They stood stock still, staring blankly into each other's eyes. A wood pigeon, whispered Uncle Felix, recovering himself first. You've been seen! A faint smile passed over Tim's startled face. There was no other expression in it. The tension was distressingly acute. One sentence, however, came to the lips of both adventurers. They uttered it under their breath together. It's disappeared. Instinctively, they held hands then. Tim stood rooted to the ground. It's center. They whispered it almost inaud inaudibly. The horror of the spot where people vanished was upon them both. The power of the wood had worn them down. Yes, but don't say it. Above all, don't say it aloud. He clapped one hand over his mouth and the other upon the boys as Tim came cuddling closer to his comforting expanse of his side. That only wakes it up and... He did not finish the sentence. Instead, his mind began to think tremendously. They were both badly frightened. What was the best thing to be done? At first, he thought, keep perfectly still. Make no slightest movement. A quiet person is not noticed. But the next instant came the truer wisdom. If anything unusual occurs, go on doing exactly what you were doing before. Hold the atmosphere, as it were. And on this latter inspiration, he decided to act at once, only to discover that Tim had realized it before him. The boy was pulling at him. Do come on, uncle. We shall go mad with fright if we keep on standing here. We'll be raving lunatics. They set off wildly then, plunging helter-skelter into silent, heartless wood. The trees miraculously opened up a way for them as they dived and stooped and wriggled forward. In which direction they were going, neither of them had the least idea. But as neither one nor the other disappeared, it was clear that they had not reached the actual center. They gasped and spluttered. Their breath grew shorter. The darkness increased. They came to all sorts of curious places that deceived them. Ways opened invitingly and closed down again and blocked advance. There were clearings that were obviously fake, open places that were plainly sham, and a dozen times they came to spots that seemed familiar, but which really they'd never seen before. Sense of direction left them, for they continually changed the angle compelled by the undergrowth to do so. Twigs leapt at them and stung their faces. Tim's cheeks were splashed with mud's Uncle Felix. Uncle Felix's clean white flannel showed irregular lines of dirty water to his knees. It was altogether a tremendous affair, in which rescue and escape were madly mingled with furious attack and terrified retreat. Everything was moving in all directions at once. They rushed headlong through the angry wood, but the wood itself rushed ever past them. It was aroused. The confusion and bewilderment had got a little more than they could manage, indeed, when, quite marvelously and unexpectedly, the darkness lifted. They saw trees separately instead of in a whirling mass. The trunks stood more apart from one another. There were patches of faint light. More, there was a line of light. It shone gray and welcome some dozen yards in front of them. Come on, follow me. And two minutes later they found themselves outside, torn, worn, and breathless upon the edge, standing exactly at the place where they had entered three quarters of an hour before. They had made an enormous circle. 
panting and half collapsed, they stood side by side in an exhausted heap. We're out, said Tim with immense relief. Profoundly satisfied with himself, he looked round at his bedraggled uncle. It was plain that he had rescued someone from an awful, hor awful and horrible death. At last, replied the other gratefully, aware that he was the rescued one. But only just in time. And they moved away in the deepening dusk toward the house, whose welcome lights shone across the intervening hayfield. Okay, I think that is a good time for a short intermission. Uh, after intermission, we will dive into chapter 13, where time hesitates. But for now, let us put up the Be Right Back screen. Doot doot. And I'm going to mute my mic and uh, drink some water, uh, you know, pet my pets, that sort of thing. I Let me do the thing, and then we will do, we'll get started on that. Just like the just like the chatbot says, uh, we're taking a short break. Have a little break yourself. Stretch. If you've been sitting the whole time like I have been, you're definitely going to need a stretch. Get hydrated. Uh, I need I need plenty of water, and you do too. Uh, take care of you know medications if you need those. I know a lot of people take medications at the same time each day, and hopefully I align close enough with that for somebody for my reminder to be worth it. Pet your animals, most especially. Uh, library is very, very snug right now. I may post a picture on Twitter. Uh, just take care of take care of things you need to take care of, generally. Uh, we will be back in probably around 15 minutes, but sometimes it's sooner, so keep one eye on the stream.
Okay. Let me just get one more stretch in for my back. Ooh, hoo -hoo. the internet died just long enough that I uh, that it claims I have started streaming twice now. So let's let's jump back in, shall we? And read what what we can read about chapter thirteen, huh? I've had an idea. One moment, I need to write that down. Uh, this one. That one, that one, that one. Where is... Ooh. Ooh. Sorry, I, I've no, I opened my, like, I programming ideas uh, notepad, and there's some fun stuff in here. I don't know if it's I I don't know I'm nervous about one of the ideas in here it's a sourdough starter tracker that I could I'm pretty sure I could reasonably pull off but I'm nervous about it because sourdough isn't as isn't as in vogue as when I had the idea I also have a bunch of notes on like a D and D spellbook app that is like a third to two thirds of the way finished and like I have some things I need to check that if they do work it, it allows me to make like six other options happen you know you know you know how it is with programming sometimes you have an idea but you're not sure the idea is real and like you don't have enough time to double check that the idea is real I could fall down that rabbit hole all night. Let's start in on chapter 13, Time Hesitates. Meanwhile, the coveted fortnight drew toward a close. Aw, oh, I, was, I was hoping the third sibling would get a little adventure of her own, but no, she lets things come to her. Anyway, it had begun on a Friday, and that left two full, clear weeks ahead. It had seemed an inexhaustible period when it started. There was the feeling like it would draw out slowly, like an ordinary lesson week, instead of which it shot downhill to Saturday with hardly a single stop. On looking back, the children almost felt unfairness. Somebody had pushed it. They'd been cheated. And of course they had been cheated. Time had played his usual trick upon them. The beginning was so prodigal of reckless promises that they had really believed a week would last forever. Childhood expects, quite rightly, to have its cake and eat it too, for there is no reason, there is no true reason why anything should ever end at all. The devices are various. A tidbit is set aside to enjoy later, thus deceiving time and checking its ridiculous hurry. But in the long run, time invariably wins. After Thursday, the week had shot into Saturday without a single pause. It whistled past. And the, tidbit sun, and the tidbit Saturday had come, yet without the usual tidbit flavor, for Saturday, as a rule, wore splashes of gold and yellow upon its latter end, being a half-holiday associated with open air and sunshine, but now, Monday already in sight, with lessons and early bed and other prohibitions by the dozen, hearts sank a little, a shadow crept upon the sun. They had a grievance, someone had cheated them of a final joy. The collapse was unexpected, and therefore wrong. And the arch-deceiver who had humbugged them they knew quite well was time. He was in their thoughts. He, marked, he mocked them all day long. Clocks grinned. Saturday, June 3rd, flaunted itself insolently in their faces. The day after tomorrow, remarked someone, noticing a calendar sta staring on the wall. And from the moment that phrase could be used, it meant the day was within measurable distance. 
Bates. Aunt Emily leaves Turnbridge Wells. Li library, what are you what are you eating? Library, buddy. Well, I hope that wasn't a bad thing you just ate, because it's gone now. Hi. What did you eat? You make me nervous when you're making munchies not at the not at the food bowl. Well, we'll see if I have to clean up puke later. He's got a very delicate stomach, don't you? He's got a very delicate stomach and a very aggressive need to eat everything. So, that that goes over real well for him. Doesn't it, Library? No, no, no. I, I, I need to make sure I got it. I, I wanted to make sure you didn't get it. But I missed. Anyway, Aunt Emily leaves Tunbridge Wells. Turn... Aunt Emily leaves Turnbridge Wells was mentioned too, sounding less unpleasant than Aunt Emily comes back. But the climax was reached when somebody started... When somebody stated bluntly, without fear of contradiction, Tomorrow's Sunday. For Sunday had no particular color. Monday was black, and Saturday was gold, but Sunday had never been painted anything. Though a buffer day between a vanished week and a week of labor coming, it was of uncertain character. Strange, grave people came back to lunch. There were collects and a vague uneasiness about the heathen being naked. Uh, naked and unfed. There was a collection, too. Pennies emerged from a stained leather purse and dropped clicking into a polished box with a slit in the top. Greenland's icy mountains also helped to put chill into the sunshine. A pause came. Time went slower than usual. God rested, they remembered, on the seventh day, yet nothing happened much, and with their Sunday clothes they put on a sort of dreadful carefulness that made play seem stiff. Stiff, unnatural, and out of place. And Daddy, too, before the day was over, invariably looked worried at the servants' board, Mother Drowsy, and Aunt Emily, like a clergyman's wife. Time sighed audibly on a Sunday. It's our last day, anyhow, they agreed, determined to live in the present, and enjoy the Saturday to the full. It was then Uncle Felix, having overheard their comments upon time, looked round abruptly, and made one of his startling remarks. Tomorrow, he said, is one of the most wonderful days that was ever invented. You'll see. And the way he said it provided the very thrill that was needed to chase the shadow from the sun, for there was a hint of promise in his voice that almost meant he had some way of delaying the arrival of that black Monday. You'll see he repeated significantly, shading his eyes with both hands and peering up at the sun. Tim and Judy watched him with keen faces. They noticed that he said tomorrow instead of Sunday, but before they could squeeze out a single question, there came a remarkable interruption from below. From somewhere near the ground it came. Maria, seated on a flower pot whose flower didn't want to grow, opened her mouth and spoke. As was already known, this didn't happen often. It was her characteristic to keep it closed. Even at the dentist, she never could be got to open her mouth because he had once hurt her. She flat re flatly refused to do so, and no amount of now open pleas had ever had the least effect on her firm decision. She was taken in vain to see the dentist. This last Saturday of the week, however, she opened. I've not had my particular adventure, was what she said. At the center of that circle where she lived in a state of unalterable bliss, the fact had struck her. The fact had struck her, and she mentioned it according. Jim and Tim and Judy turned upon her hungrily, but before they could relieve their feelings by a single word, their uncle had turned upon her too. Lowering his eyes from the great circular sun that moved in a circle through the sky, he let them fall upon the circular Maria, who reposed calmly upon the circle of the earth, which itself swung in another circle around the sun. And even further, the sun swings in a peculiar circle around our galaxy. But that's not in the book. That's just my note. Exactly. But it's coming. Your father told you a day would come. It is. He said no more than that, but it was enough to fill the remainder of the day with the recurrent thrill of a tremendous promise. Each hour seemed pregnant with a hint of exceptional delivery. There were signs and whispers everywhere, and everybody was aware of it. 
Uncle Felix looks bursting with it, as though he could hardly keep it in, and even the lesser authorities had as much as they could do to prevent it flying out of them in sudden sentences. Jackman wore a curious smile, which Judy declared was just the face she made the day Maria was born. Mrs. Horton left her kitchen, and was seen upon the lawn actually picking daisies, and even Thompson, well, when Tim and his sister came upon him basking with a pipe against the laundry window, wearing a discarded tweed coat of their father's and looking exactly like the Pope asleep, he explained his position to Tim with the extraordinary remark that even the servants' hall has dreams, and went on puffing his pipe as precisely as before. But we didn't betray it most. They knew it by the smell, perfumigated, as they called it, that he was in the passages, watering the flowers or arranging new ones on window sills. and when Tim said, "'Send any more water rats to pot at, Whedon?' The man just smiled and said, "'Good morning, Master Tim. It's Saturday.' The inflection of his tone was instantly noticed. "'Oh, I say, Whedon, how do you know? Do tell me. I won't say a word, I promise.' But the head gardener kept his one eye, the other was a glass, upon the spout of his watering can and answered in a voice that issued from his boots. "'Because tomorrow's Sunday, Master Tim, unless something happens to prevent it.' He then went quickly from the room as though he feared more questions. He took the secret with him. He was nervous about betraying what he knew. But Judy agreed with Tim that his answer proved it, because why should he have said it unless he knew? Meanwhile, that fine morning in early June slipped upon its sunny way. A heavy treacle pudding luncheon. Treacle, treacle pudding. Pudding. Oh, yes. I'm, Mama, please give me a pudding cup. I require it in my lunch box, please, Mama. A pudding. I need it. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, that fine morning in early June slipped along its sunny way. A heavy treacle pudding and treacle. P p p Can I not read the concept of treacle pudding? Is it shutting down my brain? Meanwhile, that fine morning in early June slipped along its sunny way. A heavy treacle pudding luncheon was treated properly. Uncle Felix lit his great meerschaum pipe, meerschaum pipe, and they all went out on the lawn beneath the lime trees. The undercurrent of excitement filled the air. Something was going to happen, something so wonderful that they could not speak about it. They did not dare to ask questions, lest they would somehow stop it. It was the most delicately poised affair. The least mistake might send it racing in the opposite direction, but their imaginations were so actively at work inside that they could not help whispering among themselves about it. The silence of their uncle piled up the coming wonder in an enormous heap. Something is coming, affirmed Judy in an undertone for the twentieth time, but I think it'll be after tea, won't you? Mm, probably, assented her brother, very full of treacle pudding. And he sighed. Perhaps it's somebody, do you think? Tim shrugged his shoulders carefully conscious of insecurity within. I shouldn't be surprised, will you? Judy insisted. Of course she knew as much as he did, but she wanted to make him say something definite. It's both. Things like this always come together. Yes, but it's quite new. It's never happened before. He looked sideways at her with the pity of superior knowledge. How could it? So great was his private information that he almost added, stupid. But he kept back the word for later. He repeated instead, however could it? Well, but... Don't you see? It's what Daddy always told us. He reminded her with an air, and then instantly, with overwhelming certainty, those wonder sentences of their fathers, first spoken years ago, crashed in upon their minds. Some day. A day is coming. A day will come. Tim's assurance but hurt her vanity. A little. For it was only fair that she should know something, too, however little. The force of the discovery at once obliterated all lesser personal emotions. Tim, is it really that? Tim never forgot that moment of proud ascendancy. He felt like a king or something. He whispered quickly, "We'll spoil it at all if he, if he, if he knows we've guessed." And he nodded his head toward Uncle Felix in his wicker chair. It's Maria's adventure too, remember? Judy smiled and flushed a little. He's not listening. She whispered back, ignoring Maria's claim. She was not quite so stupid as her brother thought her. But how on earth did you know? It's so wonderful! She flung the hair out of her eyes and 
wriggled away some of her suppressed excitement on the grass. Tim held his breath in agony while he watched her, but the smoke from his uncle's pipe rose steadily into the, stu into the sunny air, and his face was hidden by a paper that he held. The moment of danger passed. The boy leaned over toward his sister's ear. Where it comes from is what I want to know. And he straightened up again with the air of having delivered an ultimatum that no girl could ever possibly reply to. From? She repeated. She seemed a little disappointed. Do you mean that that may stop it coming? No, of course not. But everything must come from somewhere, mustn't it? Judy stared at him speechless while he surveyed her with an air of calm omnipotence. To ask a thing no one could answer was the same as knowing the answer oneself. Mustn't it? He repeated it with triumph. And in the inevitable pause that followed, they both instinctively glanced up at Uncle Felix. That, that same idea had occurred to both of them. Although direct questions about what was coming were obviously impermissible, an indirect question seemed fairly within the rules. The fact was, neither of them could keep quiet about it any longer. The strain was more than human nature could stand. They simply must find a well. They simply must find out or they would get at it that way. Try him. And Tim turned recklessly toward his uncle and drew a long, deep breath. I love water. It's so good. <laughs> anyway, chapter 14. Wait a minute. So we started on chapter 8. Calculating. Ruminating. So we would be six chapters. We would be through six chapters if we finish this one. And we've got plenty of time to do that. Man, I'm, I'm making tracks on this book. <laughs> I guess you can tell I'm really enjoying it. Anyway, chapter 14. Maria stirs. Uncle, he began with a rush, lest his courage should forsake him. Where does everything come from? Everything in the world, I mean. And then he waited for an answer that did not come. Uncle Felix neither moved nor spoke, and the question, like a bomb that fails to explode, produced no, re produced no result after considerable effort and expense. The boy looked down again at the alarum clock that he was trying to mend and turned the handle. It was too tightly wound to go. The stopped clock has the sulkiest face in the world. He stared at it. The handle clicked beneath the pressure of his hand. It must come from somewhere, he added with decision, half to himself. From the east, of course, advanced Judy and tried to draw her uncle by putting some buttercups against his cheek and mentioning loudly that he liked butter. Then, since neither sound nor movement issued from the man in the wicker chair, the children continued the discussion among themselves, but at the man, knowing that sooner or later he must become involved in it. Judy's answer, moreover, so far as it went, was excellent. The sun rose in the east, and the wind most frequently mentioned came also from that quarter. Easter, when everything rose again, was connected with the same point of the com compass. The east was enormously far away with a kind of fairyland remoteness. The dragon rugs in Daddy's study and the twisted weapons in the hall were easty too. According to Tim, it was a golden, yellow, crimson sort of mysterious blazing hole of a place which no adequate picture had ever been shown to them. China and Japan were too much photographed, but the east... The east was vague and marvelous, the beginning of all things, camel-distant, as they'd phrased it, with great Asia upon its ma magical frontiers. For Asia, being equally unphotographed, still shimmered with uncommon qualities. Sorry, that sentence, that sentence had a big, like, I need to pronounce Asia, Asia, energy. But chiefly, it was a vast hole where travelers disappeared and left no trace, and to leave no trace was simply horrible. The easier you go, the less chance there is, maintained Judy. She said this straight into the paper that screened her uncle's face, without the smallest result of any kind whatsoever. Then Tim recalled something that Colonel... S <sighs> oh, excuse me. Then Tim recalled something that Colonel Stumper had said once and let fly with it, aiming his voice beneath the paper's edge. 
East is east, he announced with considerable violence, but might as well have declared that it was south for all the response obtained. It was very odd, he thought. His uncle's mind must be awfully full of something. For he remembered Comeback Stumper saying the same thing once to Daddy at the end of a frightful argument about missionaries and idols, and Daddy had been unable to find any reply at all. Yet Uncle Felix did not stir a finger even. Accordingly, he made one more effort. He recited in a loud voice the song that Stumper had made up about it. If that had no, eff if that had no effect, then they must try other means altogether. The East is an endless place that lies beyond discovery, where travelers leave no trace, are lost without recovery. Both North and South have got a pole, men stand on the equator, but the East is just an awful hole you never heard of later. It had no effect. Goodness, he thought, the man must be ill. Or perhaps like the alarm clock, he was too tightly wound to go, and the burden of the secret he contained so wonderfully up his sleeve half choked him. The boy grew impatient. He nudged Judy and made an odd grimace, and Judy, belonging to the sex that took risks and thought little of personal safety when a big end was to be obtained, stood up and put the buttercups against her own cheek. "'But I like it ever so much more than you do,' she said in a loud voice. The move was not a bad one. The paper wobbled, sank a quarter of an inch, revealed the bridge of the reader's nose, then held severely steady again. Whereupon Tim, noticing a sign of weakening, followed his sister's lead, rose, kicked the tired clock like a ball across the lawn, and exclaimed in a tone of challenge to the universe, But where did everything come from? Before that, before the east, I mean. And he glared at his immobile uncle through the paper with an air of fearful accusation, as though he distinctly held that he was to blame. If that didn't let the cat out of the bag, nothing would. The big man, however, rested heavily with his legs crossed, as though he still had not heard. Doubtless he felt as heavy as he looked, for the afternoon was warm, and luncheon, well, at any rate, he remained neutral and inactive. Something might happen to divert philosophical inquiry into other channels. A rat might poke its nose above the pond, a big fish might jump, an awfully rare butterfly come dancing, or Maria as on rare occasions she had been known to do, might stop discussion with a word of power. The chances were in his favor on the whole, and so he waited. But nothing happened. No rat, nor fish, nor butterfly did the things expected of them. They were on the childer in the side this time. Maria sat blocked and motionless against the landscape, and the round world dozed. Yes, but the music of the world was humming. The bees droned by. There was a whisper among the unruffled leaves. Tim slapped him sharply on the knee. The man shuffled and looked over the top of his illustrated paper with an air of shocked surprise. Eh, Tim? Where we all come from, you say? Everything, not only us. That's it. Now then, Maria added quietly, as if she'd done all the work. Uncle Felix laid down his entertaining pictures of public men in misfit clothing, furiously hitting tiny balls over as much uncultivated land as possible, and sighed. Their violent attitudes had given him a delightful sens sensation of repose. They were the men who governed England, and this savage hitting was proof of their surplus energy. He resigned himself, but with an air. Well, I suppose it all just began, somehow, of itself, and he stole a sideways glance at a picture of a stage beauty attired like a female Guy Fox. It was created in six days, of course, as last, said Tim, regarding him with patient dignity. We remember all that, but where it came from is what we thought you'd know. He closed the illustrated paper and moved it out of reach, while the man brushed from his beard the grass and stuff that Judy had arranged there cleverly in a decorative pattern. From? repeated Uncle Felix, as though the word were unfamiliar. Your body and mind, the boy resumed, ignoring the pretense that laziness offered in place of information. All that kind of thing. Trees, mountains, birds, caterpillars, people like Aunt Emily, and clergymen, and volcanoes, and elephants, oh, everything in the world, everywhere. There was another sigh, and another pause dropped down upon creation, while they watched a looper caterpillar that clung to the edge of the illustrated paper and made futile circles in the air with a knob it called its head. 
Someone had forgotten to let it down the ladder it expected, or perhaps it too was asking unanswerable questions of the sun. I believe, announced Judy, still smarting under a sense of recent neglect, just came from nowhere. It's all in a great huge circle, and we go round and round and rounder, she went on as, to, as no one met her challenge, till we're finished. She avoided her brother's eye, but glanced winningly at Uncle Felix, remembering that she had gained support from him before by a similar device. At Maria, she looked down. You know nothing anyhow, her expression said, so you must agree. I don't finish, said Maria quietly, whereupon Tim, feeling that the original question was being shelved, made preparation to obliterate her, <laughs> when Uncle Felix intervened with a longer observation of his own. Well, it's not such a bad idea, he said, glancing sideways at Maria with approval. That circle business. Everything certainly does go round. The earth's round, and the sun's round, and as Maria said, a circle never finishes. He paused, reflecting deeply. Who made the circle? Ah, that is the point. Someone must have made it some day, mustn't they? They stared at him, as probably the animals stared at Adam, wondering what their splendid names were going to be. The yearning in their eyes was enough to make a rock produce sweet-scented time. Even the looper steadied its pinpoint head to listen, but nothing happened. Uncle Felix looked dumber than the clock. He looked hot, confused, and muddled, too. He kept his eyes upon the grass. He fumbled in his pockets for a match and spoke no word. What? asked him abruptly, by way of hint that something further was expected of him. Uncle Felix looked up with a start. Like Proteus, who changed his shape to save himself the trouble of prophesying, he swiftly changed the key to save himself, providing accurate information he didn't possess. Well, it wasn't a circle exactly. It was a thought, a great, white, wonderful, shining thought. That's what started the whole business first. And he looked around, hopefully, at the eager faces. Somebody thought it all, he went on recklessly, and it all came true that way, see? They waited in silence for particulars. Somebody thought it all out first, and so it simply had to happen. There was an interval of some thirty seconds, and then Tim asked, But who thought him? He said it with much emphasis. Uncle Felix sat up with energy and lit his pipe. His listeners drew closer, with the exception of Maria, whose life seemed concentrated in her fixed and steady eyes. Well, it's like this, you see. If you go into the schoolroom, you find a lot of things lying about everywhere. Blocks, toys, engines, all sorts of things, don't you? Yes. Well, what's the good of them until you think something about them? Think them into something? Some game or meaning or other. They're nothing but a lot of useless stuff lying untidily upon the floor. See what I mean? They nodded, but again without enthusiasm. With our end of the world place, he went on, seeing that they listened attentively, it's the same again. It was nothing but a rubbish heap until we thought it into something wonderful, which of course it is, he hastened to add. But by thinking about it, we discovered we created it. They nodded again. Somebody grunted. Maria watched the caterpillar crawling up his sleeve. The things, the place, and the toys, he resumed hopefully, were there all the time, but they meant nothing. They weren't alive until we thought about them, he blew a cloud of smoke. So you see, he continued with effort, we could only think out what everything meant. Uh, we could find out what everything meant and where it came from. Everything would be all right, don't you see? Judy's expression was distraught and puzzled. Maria's eyes were closed so lightly, or so tightly, that her entire face seemed closed. The pause drew out. Yes, but where does everything come from? He valued the lengthy explanation at just exactly nothing. So there simply must be a beginning somewhere, added Judy. They were at the starting point again. They had merely made a circle. And Uncle Felix found himself in difficulties of, difficulties of his own creating. Where everything came from puzzled him as much as it puzzled the children, or the looper caterpillar that was now crawling from his flannel, co flannel collar to his neck and contemplating the thicket of his dense black hair. His dense back hair, even better. Why ask these terrible questions, he thought as he looked around at the sunshine and trees. Life would be no happier if he knew, since everything was already here, going along quite pleasantly and usefully. It really couldn't help matters much to know precisely where it all came from. Possibly not. But it would have helped him enormously in his relations with the children, 
his particular world at the moment if he could have provided them with a satisfactory explanation. And he knew quite well what they expected from him. That dreadful someday hung in the balance between success and failure. And it was then that assistance came from a most unlikely quarter, from Maria. There was no movement in the stolid head. The eyes nearly rolled round like small blue moons upon the expanse of the expressionless face. But the lips parted and she spoke. She asked a question. And her question shifted the universe back upon its ultimate foundations. It set a problem far deeper than the mere origin of everything. It touched the cause. Why? She inquired blandly. It seemed a bombshell had fallen among them. Maria had closed her eyes again. Her face was as calm as a cabbage, as still as a mushroom in a storm. She claimed the entire, she claimed the entire discussion somehow as her own. Yet she had merely exercised her prerogative of being herself. Having gone to the root of the matter with a monosyllable, she retired again into her eternal center. She had nothing more to offer, at least at the moment. Why? They had never thought of why there should be anything. It was far more interesting than where. Why was a deeper question than whence. It made them feel more important, for one thing. Somebody, but somebody who was not there, owed them a proper, proper explanation about it. The burden of apology or excuse was lifted instantly from Uncle Felix's shoulders, for obviously he had nothing to do with the reason for their being the one. Without a moment's hesitation, he flung his arms out, let the pipe fall from his lips, and burst into song. Why should there be anything? Why should we be here? It isn't where we've came with it isn't where we've come from, but why should we appear? It's really inexplicable, extraordinary, queer. Why should we come and talk a bit and then just disappear? Why, why, why? shouted the two elder children. The air was filled with flying whys they tried to sing the verse. Let's dance it, cried Judy, leaping to her feet. Give us the words again, please. She picked up the clock and plumped it down into Maria's uncertain lap. You beat time. It's to the tune of Onward Christian Soldiers. A tune I do not know, so do not expect me to carry it. Maria, disinclined to budge and less obliged to, did nothing. Oh, it's a beastly tune. I hate those Sunday hymn tunes. They're not real a bit. He watched Judy and his uncle capering hand in hand among the flower beds. He didn't feel like dancing himself. He looked at the clock that, like Maria and himself, refused to go. He looked at Maria, fastened immovably upon the lawn. The clock lay glittering in the sunshine. Maria sat, shining ball beside it. He felt the afternoon was a failure somewhere. Things weren't going quite as he wanted. The clock wasn't going either. And when they did go, they went of their own accord, independent of himself, of his direction, guidance, wishes. He was out of it. This was not the time to dance. What was the meaning of it all? It had to do some... It had had to do somehow with a clock that wouldn't go. Had to go with Maria, who wouldn't budge. The clock had stopped of its own accord. That lay at the bottom of it all, he felt. Some day things would be different, more satisfactory. Satisfactory, more real. Some, some day. And strange new ideas, very vague, very dim, very far away, very queer and very wonderful, poured through his searching, questioning little mind. Be time, shouted Judy to her motionless sister. I told you to be time. You're doing nothing. You never do. Tim stood watching them while the words rang on in his head. You're doing nothing. You never do. How wonderful it was. Maria never did anything, yet was always there in everything. And the others, how funny they were, too. They looked like an elephant and a bird, he thought. For Judy hopped and fluttered while his uncle moved heavily, making holes in the soft lawn with his great feet. Be time, be time, cried Judy at intervals. What a strange phrase it was to beat time. Why beat it? It wasn't there unless it was beaten. Poor time. And Maria refused to beat it. His eye wandered from Maria to the dancers, and a kind of reverie stole over him. What was the use of dancing unless there was something to dance round? Maria was round. Why didn't they dance round her? His thoughts returned to Maria. How funny Maria was. She just sat there doing nothing at all. Maria was dull and unenterprising, yet somehow everything came round to her in the end. 
It was just because she waited. She never hurried. She was sort of center. Only it must be rather stupid to just be a center. Then suddenly two ideas struck him at the same instant, scattering his dreamy state of reverie. The first was, everything comes from a center like Maria. That's where everything comes from. The second, bearing no apparent relation to it, found expression in words. I know what. Let's go to the end of the world and make a fire and burn things. And he looked at Maria as though he had discovered America. Be time, oh do be time, cried Judy breathlessly. We're going to make a fire. There's lots, there's, there's lots of things to burn, Tim cried. He looked about him as though to choose a place, but he couldn't find one. He pointed vaguely, first at Maria as though she was the thing to burn, and at the landscape generally. Then you can dance around it, he added convincingly to cinch the matter. But the bird and the elephant continued their gymnastic exercises on the lawn, while Maria turned her eyes without moving her head and watched them too. Then, while the tune of onward Christian soldiers filled the air, Tim and Maria began... began Tim and Maria began an irrelevant argument about things in general. Tim, at least, told her things while she laid the clock down upon the grass and listened. But the flood of language rolled off her as a minute's roll from the face of the sun, producing no effect. There was wonder in her big blue eyes, wonder that never seemed to end. But minutes don't decrease merely because the rising and setting of the sun sends them flying. There are not fewer words in a boy's vocabulary merely because he uses up a lot in saying things. Both words and minutes seemed to circle without beginning or end. It was most odd and strange, this feeling of endlessness that was everywhere in the air. And long before Tim had gotten even to the middle of his enormous speech, he'd forgotten all about the fire, forgotten about dancing, about burning things, forgotten about everything everywhere, because his roving eye had fallen again upon the clock. The clock absorbed his interest, lay there glittering in the sunshine beside Maria. It wasn't going. Maria wasn't going either. It had stopped. He realized abruptly, realized it without rhyme or reason, that a stopped clock, a, stop, a clock that isn't going, was a mystery. And the tide of words dried up in him. He choked. Something was wrong with the universe, for the clock stopped. His clock. Time. Time must... He was unable to think it out, but time must surely get muddled and go wrong, too. And he moved over to Maria just as she was about to burst into tears. He sat down beside her. At the same moment, Judy and Uncle Felix, thinking a quarrel was threatening, stopped their dancing and joined the circle, too. They stood with arms akimbo, panting, silent, waiting for something to happen so they could interfere and set it right again. But nothing did happen. There was deep silence only. Slanting sunshine lay across the lawn. The wind passed, sighing through the lime trees, and the clock stared up into their faces, motionless, a blank expression on it. Stop. They formed a circle round it. No one moved or spoke. There was a queer, deep pause. The sun watched them. The sky was listening. The entire afternoon stood still. Something else beside the clock, it seemed, was, was slowing up. Tomorrow's Sunday. Time's getting awfully short, was in the air, inaudibly. Let's sit down, whispered Tim, already seated himself, but anxious to feel the others close. Judy and Uncle Felix obeyed. They all sat round in a circle, staring at the shining disk of the motionless stopped clock. Might have been a lucky bag by the way they watched it with expectant faces. But Maria was also in that circle, sitting calmly in its center. Then Uncle Felix cautiously lifted the glittering round thing and held it in his hand, put his ear down to listen, and shook his head. It hasn't gone since this time yesterday, Tim said in a low tone. It's twenty-four hours, he calculated, adding it on the fingers of both hands. A whole day, murmured Judy, as if taken by surprise somehow. A day and a night, I mean. She, as she exchanged a glance of significant expectation with her brother, but it was at their uncle they looked the moment after, because of the strange and sudden sound that issued from his lips, for it was like a cry, and his face wore a flushed and curious uh, expression they could not fathom. The face and the cry were signs of something utterly unusual. He was startled, out of himself. 
A marvelous idea had evidently struck him. It's either something, thought Judy, or else he's got a pain. But Tim's mind was quicker. He's got it, the boy decided, meaning we got it out of him at last. Their maneuvers had taken so long of accomplishment that the original purpose had almost been forgotten. A day. A whole day. Uncle Felix was mumbling to himself in a dazed kind of happy way. An, an entire day, I do I declare. He looked round solemnly, yet with growing excitement into the children's faces. Twenty-four hours, an entire day, he went on half beneath his breath. Some day, of course, Tim said in a low voice, catching the mood of wonder, while Judy added, equally stirred up, a day will come. And then Uncle Felix, breaking out of his strange reverie with effort, raised his voice and looked as if the end of the world had come. But do you realize what it means? he asked him sharply. Do you understand what's happened? He drew a long, deep breath that quivered with suppressed amazement and waited several seconds for their answers in vain. The children, the children gazed at him without uttering a word. They made no movement either. The arresting tone of his voice and a certain huge expression in his eyes made everything in the world seem different. It was a moment of real life. He had discovered something stupendous. But explanation being beyond them, they attempted no immediate answer to his question. The pressure of interest had blocked every means of ordinary expression known to them. Then Uncle Felix spoke again, his big eyes fixing Tim piercingly, like a pin. When did it stop? he inquired gravely. He meant to make quite sure of his discovery before revealing it. There must be no escape, no slip, no carelessness. When did it stop, I ask you, Tim? Tim was a trifle vague. I was asleep. He whispered. When I woke up, it wasn't going. Y you wound it? Oh, I wound it right enough. What time is it? The clock or the day, Uncle? He was confused a little. He wished to be awfully accurate. Uncle Felix explained that he desired to know what time the clock had stopped. The importance of the answer could be judged by the intentness of his expression while he waited. The finger hands were at four, said the boy at length. Uncle Felix gave a jump. <laughs> he exclaimed triumphantly. That it stopped of its own accord. They could have screamed with excitement, though without the least idea what they were excited about. You could have heard a butterfly breathing. It stopped at dawn, he said louder. Dawn? piped Tim, unable to think of anything else, but obliged to utter something. Dawn, yes, cried Uncle Felix, louder still. It stopped of its own accord at dawn, just at the beginning of a new day. It stopped. It's marvelous, don't you see? It's marvelous. Goodness, cried Judy, with her mind obfuscated, yet thrilled with a transport of inexplicable delight. It is marvelous. I say, Tim shouted, dropping his voice suddenly, for he too was at a loss of any more intelligible relief in words. They, th they sat and stared at their amazing uncle. There was a hush upon the entire universe. There was marvel, mystery, but at first there was also muddle. They waited, holding their breath with difficulty. Someone, it seemed, could uh, must either explode or, or something else. They knew not exactly what. It would hardly have surprised them if Judy had suddenly flown, flown through the air, Tim vanished down a hole, or Maria gleamed at them from the inside of a quivering bubble of soap. There was this kind of intoxicating feeling, delicious and intense. Even tomorrow might not be Sunday after all. It felt strange and wonderful enough for all that. The possibility that some day was coming was close at hand, it had in some mysterious way become a probability. It was clear at last why Uncle Felix had been so heavy and preoccupied. You see what's happened? He continued after the long pause. You see what it all means, the strange stopping the clock at dawn? They admitted nothing. The least mistake on their part might prevent, might spoil or cripple it. The depth and softness of his tone warned them. They stared and waited. He gathered them closer to him with nearer, with both arms. Even Maria wiggled slightly nearer, an inch or so. It means, he said, still in lower tones, the calendar, and stopped abruptly to examine the effect upon them. Now, ordinarily, they knew quite well what a calendar was, but this new strange emphasis he put upon it robbed the word suddenly of all its original meaning. Their minds went questioning at once. What is a calendar? asked Judy carefully. Exactly, she added to make her meaning absolutely clear. It sounded almost like a nonsense word. Exactly. 
he repeated cautiously, yet with some great motion and emotion working in him. What is a calendar? That's the whole question. I'll try and tell you what a calendar is. He drew a deeper breath, a great effort being evidently needed. A calendar, he went on, while the words sounded less real each time it was uttered, is an invention of clever scientific men to note the days as they pass. It records the passing days. It's a plan to measure time. It's made of paper and has the date and name of the day stamped in ink on separate sheets. When a day has passed, you tear off a sheet. That day is done with, gone. There are 365 of these separate sheets in a year. It's just an invention of scientific men to measure the passing of time, you see. And they did say that they saw. Another invention, he resumed, his face betraying more and more emotion, is a clock. A clock is just a mechanical invention that ticks off the movements of the sun into seconds and minutes and hours. Both clocks and calendars, therefore, are mere measuring devices. Measuring tricks, even. Time goes on or does not go on, just the same whether you possess these inventions or whether you do not possess them. Both clocks and calendars go at the same rate, whether time goes fast or slow. See? A tremendous discovery began to poke its nose above the edge of their familiar world, but they couldn't pull it far enough. Uh, they could not pull it up far enough to see as yet. Uncle Felix continued to pull it up for them, that he too was muddled never once occurred to them. Scientific men, like all other people, are not always to be relied upon. They make mistakes, like you, or Miss Thompson, or Miss Horton, or even me. Clocks, for all we know, are full of mistakes and ever, forever going wrong. But the same thing has happened to calendars as well. Calendars are notoriously inaccurate. They simply cannot be depended upon. No calendar has ever been entirely voracious, nor ever will be. Like elastic, they are sometimes too long and sometimes too short imperfectly constructed. He paused and looked at them. Yes, they said breathlessly, aware dimly that accustomed foundations were already sliding from beneath their feet. Half the calendars of the world are simply wrong, he continued more boldly still, and the people who live by them are in a muddle consequently, a muddle about time. England is no exception to the rest. Is it any wonder that time bothers, bothers us in the way it does? Always time to do this, or time to do that, or not time enough to finish, or and so on? No, it isn't. Of course. Well, sometimes a nation finds out its mistake and alters its calendar. Russia's done this. The Russian New Year and Easter are not the same as ours. Pope Gregory the Thirteenth ordered the day after October, October 4th, 1582, should be called October 15th. He called it the Gregorian calendar, but there are lots of other calendars besides. There's the Jewish and Jewish and the Mohammedan Mohammedan Mohammedan. I've done a while I stumbled over that. There are lots of other calendars besides. There are the Jewish and the Mohammedan Mohammedan. Apparently, I can't say that correctly. My apologies. And a variety of calendars in the East. All of them can't be right. The result is that none of them are right, and the world is in confusion. Some calendars mark off too many days. Others mark too few. Half the world is behind of time, and the other half ahead of it. The governments know this quite well, but they dare not say anything, because their officials are muddled enough as it is. There's everywhere this fearful rush and hurry to keep up with time. All are terrified of being late. Too late, or too early. Naturally. And the extraordinary result of all these mistakes, he went on marvelously, is simply this. A considerable amount of time has never been recorded at all by any of them. There are a lot of extra days, unused, unrecorded days, still at large, if only we could find them. Extra days, they gasped. Him and Judy's mouths were open now, and slowly opening wider every minute. Only Maria's mouth kept closed. Her great blue eyes were closed as well. She looked as if she could have told them all about this in a couple of words. Knocking about on the loose. He explained further, then paused and stared into the upturned faces. Sort of escaped days that have never been torn off calendars, ticked away by clocks, unused, unfilled, unlived, slipped out of time, that is. Then, when Daddy said a day is coming and all that, Tim managed to squeeze out through the pain. Tim managed to squeeze out as though the pain of the excitement hurt his lips. Of course, replied Uncle Felix, nodding his great head. Of course, of course. Sooner or later, one of those lost extra days is bound to crop up, and what's more, 
He glanced down significantly at the stopped alarm clock. I think. He broke off in the middle of the sentence. They all stood up. Tim picked up the clock and handed it to his uncle, who held it tightly against his chest a moment, and put it into his capacious, capacious pocket. I think it's come. An entire minute passed without sound. We can fill it with anything we like, asked Judy, overawed a little. Anything we like. And do things over and over again, sort of double and in no hurry, Tim whispered. Anything, anywhere, anyhow, and no end to it all. No hurry either. It was too much to think about all at once, too big to realize. They all sat down again beside Maria, who had not moved an inch in any direction at all. She was a picture of sublime repose. We've only got to find it, and climb into it, and sail away, murmured Uncle Felix, with a strange catch in his breath they readily understood. And will it begin? At dawn. Tomorrow morning? At dawn tomorrow morning. Tomorrow's Sunday. Tomorrow is an extra day, he said amazingly. They hesitated a moment, stared, frowned, smiled then opened their eyes and mouths still wider than before. Oh, like that? Yes, like that. It means getting in behind time, you see. There's no time in an extra day because it's never been recorded by calendar or clock. That means getting behind the great hurrying humbug of a thing that blinds and confuses everybody the whole world over. It means getting closer to the big reality that... He broke off sharply, aware that his own emotion was carrying him out of his depth and out of their depth likewise. He changed the sentence. We shall be in eternity, he whispered very softly, so softly that it was scarcely audible, perhaps. And it was then that Maria, still seated solidly upon the lawn, looked up and asked another baffling and unexpected question. This was her private and particular adventure, and living ever at the center of the circle, Maria claimed even eternity as especially her own. Her question was gigantic. It was infinitely bigger than her original question, why? It was the greatest question in the universe, because it answered itself adequately at once. It was the question the undying gods have flung about the listening cosmos since time first began its tricky cheating of delight, and still fling into the echoing hearts of men and children everywhere. The stars and insects, the animals and birds, even the stones and flowers all keep the glorious echo flying. Why not? she asked. And it was unanswerable. Okay, folks. That was such a, like, stellar note to end upon. I'm gonna call it an evening. Uh, I'm really loving this book. Like, also, I have noticed that like is my filler word rather than um, and it has been driving me bonkers. Um, see and now i go um i've been really enjoying this book it has i've pointed this out several times before it is, but it is suffuse with wonder over the simplicities of life in the same way that the secret garden is and it is scratching a very particular itch in my head that i have that has been left unscratched for far too long uh i'm really enjoying this but instead of rattling on for uh, approximately forever again, uh, I'm going to call it a night. This has been Paper Cuts, and I hope it didn't sting. Mm -hmm.